and welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim. I'm glad to see all you guys joined us tonight. Tonight, we're going to have John Beasley present his uh, view of the world and his topic. The College of Complexes consists of the following format. <coughs> One, we have a uh, brief question and answer period. Second part is that our speaker will then present up to about an hour or so. Then we'll have our question and answer period after that. And then we'll have our infamous rebuttal period where each of you guys have a set amount of time to uh, rebut the speaker or on or off topic. We generally finish about nine o'clock or so. And uh, after that, you know, I'll keep the Zoom call open for a while if, if anybody else wants to talk or keep, keep at it for a while if we uh, stop the official ceremonies. And there are two rules at the college. One is one fool at a time. And the second one is no personal attacks. That means I can't call Charlie a schmuck, which I've been tempted to do a few times. Or, or, or even Ellen, a crazy, a crazy woman because of her conspiracy theories. But that's another story. Anyway, I'm sorry, I've already violated that. So I'm going to shut up now. It's, you've, you've, uh, Margaret, you've, thank you for helping us keep the rabbit hole clean. <laughs> You know what Yay. I mean? All right, let's, uh, all right, with that, we're gonna start the announcements and uh, Charlie, if you're ready, I'll, uh, I'm all set for you. Okay, welcome to meeting number 3,650. That's 3650, the College of Complexes, the playground for people who think. First of all, our next open dates, are April the 2nd and the 23rd. And although I am not a capitalist, I will give you a brief advertisement for our upcoming programs. We've got 12 upcoming programs. Okay, on January the 29th, this should be really good. The Immokalee Farm Workers, Tomato Pickers, will be speaking at the college and they're going to have far more we speaking in Spanish with the translation. They're setting it up. They're engaging a nationwide boycott of Wendy's. And they also operate something called the Fair Food Program. You're all for fair food, I would presume. Anyhow, that should be a good program on the 29th. Transitioning into February on the 5th. Uh, we're going to learn about what the Democrats need to do to counter uh, this Republicans' attack on voting rights and so forth, and their negligence and re reluctance to follow democratic process and take the United States Capitol and things of that nature. That's on the 5th. Ken Williams, good talk. On the 12th, the Illinois Green Party will be joining us to talk about the upcoming election and how to get your initiative on the ballot and the initiatives that will be uh, within the city of Chicago. So the Green Party um, will be here on the 12th, 19th. Uh, we're gonna be talking about the US war on Venezuela. Um, a lot of criticism of the nation for adapting socialistic uh, principles. We'll, we'll hear from Stanfield Smith on that foreign affairs. On February the 26th, this is gonna be a current topic. We're gonna be talking about autonomous self-driven automobiles. Um, they're even looking to have auto autonomously driven railroad trains. I just posted that around the uh, to the railroad community. So this would be uh, an author of a new book um, on uh, high-tech automobile transportation. Transitioning into March, Dan Weinberg, I see he's here tonight. Um, we'll be talking about the necessities of maintaining food and water. You all need food and water, I guess, I would hope. Um, should be an excellent program. He's got a number of links you might want to check out. Uh, on the 12th, we're going to be hearing about the war on Nicaragua. Los Sandinistas. That's what I say. Eh? El Camino Luminoso. We have to go down the shining path. 
Anyhow, the war on Nicaragua. On March the 19th, we're going to hear a, a political memoir by D. Knight. By the way, I just posted, he gave us the intro to the book, and he's got a political manifesto. You all should read his manifesto in advance as a homework. On March um, the 26th, uh, Jian Li will be returning, and she's going to be talking on how the yin-yang dynamism is operating across the universe and dominating our personal lives and affairs. So that's on uh, the 26th. On April, we're getting into April, April the 9th, the One Earth Collective. Like it or not, we are all residents of One Earth. But we're getting into our Earth Day series of speakers. So the One Earth Collective. Um, on the 16th of April, we're going to take a look at hydrogen and its application as the fuel of the future. Hydrogen. Good. That's what Good. we're going to be using. Not Texas tea. No more. No more Texaco. We're going hydro, man. <laughs> and you can make that right here in Chicago. Yeah. All you want. We got a great lake set to do it. On April the thirtieth. Yours truly. This is it. Now listen. I've given probably the I've given the best talks ever at the college, and this has turned out to be the best one of all. All of them. But I'm going to be talking about how there is a proof of a primitive species residing in the forests of the United States. And a lot of topics are on the show on the topic of forestation mm -hmm. and why we have to preserve their habitat and the habitat for other animals. Mm -hmm. I'm going to give a little plug here. Back to the beginning of the page, we have two new features. We have a one page schedule right at the top of the page uh, where it says current schedule of speakers. And there's a uh, there's very quick and precise way of ascertaining what the upcoming schedule is with all appropriate links. Look at that. Hey, don't get any better than that. Oh, who never did that knows what they're doing. Uh, also, we have another little thing we're added. Um, we're talking about doing a once a month film evening, film discussion group. It's not quite put together yet, but uh, there's a link there of all kinds of videos. Now these are films and documentaries, uh, not necessarily talking heads and none of those loony uh, videos that <laughs> are floating around yeah. the internet. I Notice they're all communist. I can vigorously label that. <laughs> <laughs> any of those little things. And last of all, I would like to personally thank our speaker tonight, Mr. John Beasley. Um, he was scheduled on relatively short notice because the people I had scheduled uh, had, had some issues with COVID and were recovering from it. Uh, so I want to thank Jan. John for filling in. And by the way, Brian, I have to keep up on these figures, but only about, we know nationwide of any given workforce out there that we're finding only three or 4% or most of the employees are refusing to get vaccinated. And that's the figures that we're using in the AFL-CIO for negotiating uh, return to work arrangements. Anyhow, I took a little time for an editorial, but hey, <laughs> that's okay. Anyhow, thank you very much, Tim. Take it away. All right. Uh, and if you're ready to speak, John, uh, I don't know if you're going to be using the share screen tonight or whatnot, but uh, it's all. No, I'm just going to speak to gonna... okay. from, uh, from my notes. All right. When you're um, ready to go, just uh, go ahead and start. Okay. Well, uh, All right. enjoy I your trust presentation. You can hear, okay? okay. I think everybody I trust can hear you, John. All right. All right. Okay. And of course, you'll have to uh, wade through my British accent. So even after 50 years, I retain it. 
Pretty much. Blimey. Well, but when I go to England, they think I'm an American. So there you yes. go. Anyway, so tonight I'm going to talk about the fleecing of America. As a bit of self-promotion, this is not really, it's somewhat of a follow-on from the book I wrote 10 years ago titled The um, Sabotaging America, which was really about the, um, the crash of 2008 and the, uh, the, the how the corporations really uh, have sabotaged America, aided by the money elites. And uh, on, on the back of it, I won't go to, into all of it, but it says, in effect, the ruling class or the ruling elite had sabotaged the future of America for its own enrichment. And I also say that first and foremost, however, the country has to face up to some very unpalatable truths and force its politicians, especially in the Senate, to do the same. So anyway, I, I do recommend the book. Every now and again, I, I read it. It's, it's, it's quite a good read. Um, so. Anyway, so the premise of, of this talk, Fleecing America, is, is what I would say the quality of life of America has been degraded, especially over the last 40 years. And a quality is, must, is uh, equally important as quantity of life. In fact, it might even be more important. And so really the, the quality has to do with the cultural values of America. And so I would say that these cultural values, I won't list them all, but the most important ones is really giving and receiving fair treatment, tolerance of others, simple respect, care, and kindness, putting social good above personal good, ensuring democracy flourishes equal justice for all, and above all, investing in America and especially its people. Now, my contention is that America got off to, when it became independent from the British over 200 years ago, it got off to a very bad cultural start because of the situation it inherited from the home country. And so, as I say, today's problems has much to do with the culture inherited from Britain in the late 18th century and early 19th century. And so, really, it goes down to uh, the culture of economics infused with religious ideology. They, they, they sort of progress together. And so, of course, uh, Britain has moved on uh, since then. In fact, Britain does not have a written constitution, and so it can adapt and change, you know, to meet changing circumstances. America has this fixed constitution, which is like carved in stone and almost cannot be changed. The main worst feature is this notion of you know, the, you know, the balance of powers and, and uh, the, uh, the balance of interests of, of these three uh, entities of state, you know, the, the, the president, the Congress, and the Supreme Court. And so basically, if these are at odds, nothing gets done. And right now, I think we're in that same boat. So um, I'm not a great lover of the American Constitution, as, as you can uh, understand later. Anyway, as I say, um, so Britain um, has had See, the, the, actually, this, uh, this the book on Britain history, you know, is uh, you had there's, there's 15 volumes of, of Oxford English uh, uh, history going back and starting with the Romans. Now, of course, but mostly um, modern Britain really started 10 centuries ago with William the Conqueror, 1066. Um, and so over the last uh, 10 centuries, Britain has had three different economic systems. The first one, of course, was the feudal system, and that lasted from the 11th century to the 14th century. And so this came about because when William the Conqueror conquered England, he, he never really conquered Wales, Scotland, or Ireland, but he did conquer most of, of England. Um, and so 
he was he owned everything the king owned everything and he parceled out the land to his lords and so you had the lords of various counties like the lord of essex the, the lord of um, lancashire lord of cumberland and so on so it was all uh, so because all the wealth of course in those days was tied was tied to land and everyone under him reported at this hierarchical structure from the peasants at the bottom of the pecking order up, up to the lord of the manor, up to the barons, up and on, on up to the king. So it was a hierarchical structure. Now, of course, the peasants were at the, at the bottom, and they, of course, worked on the lord's lands. You know, they they tilled his fields and um, uh, were servants in in his manorial house. They were given um, a small plot of land where they could grow their own food and, and have uh, animals on. And even today, they, they were the so-called common lands. And even today, you go to cities and these lands are still referred to as the commons. And that's what they, that was the purpose of them. So they, they could be self-sufficient while serving the Lord of the manor. So this hierarchical system really is, it was almost feudal system carried on in America, actually over the slavery system. And in many ways, we in America, in, under capitalism, we almost have a feudal system. You know, we have a hierarchical system. You know, you might, you, you might be a worker, but you're at the bottom of the pecking order. And if you dare to disagree with the uh, CEO and, and the, the top brass, you're out the door. So you see many, so the system really is carried on the same notions of this hierarchy controlling everything. And so, as I said, the, uh, this feudal system lasted uh, for about five centuries, 11th to the 14th. Then, of course, in the 15th century, this tiny island began to sail around the world and develop colonies. And so, and, and therefore developed um, markets for its, uh, its goods. They were mostly in those days textile goods and so on. And so they, 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 the, these people, they became the merchants who, who were doing this, were granted charters from the king. And, and they became quite wealthy. And this system uh, from the 15th to the 18th century was, was called the mercantile system. Uh, and so, and so, well then, um, when in the um, 18th century, of course, you had the Industrial Revolution, which started in England, and of course this required a fair amount of money, and so the wealthy um, merchants of the day uh, became capitalists. They provided the money, and that fueled the uh, the growth of industry in Britain. Uh, the, um, uh, so that really covers, so that, that, so that the capitalist system, as I say, started in the 18th century and continued today, till today. So you had three different uh, economic systems. Now, when it comes to religion, and I said religion is, is, has always been tied up with economics, in fact, um, in Britain, you had two religions over the last 10 centuries. From the 11th to the 16th century, you had the Roman Catholic religion. And from the 16th until today, the, the state religion is now Protestant. Now, the reason for that is in the 5036, King Henry VIII, who apparently had eight wives and shot some of their heads off. Anyway, he could never, uh, create a son and so he wanted to divorce some of his wives and of course that was forbidden uh, under the catholic church so he said well to hell with that i'll uh, i'll form I'll, I'll i'll join luther and and the protestant religion and in doing so he also confiscated the, the wealth of the catholic church so that revolved to the state but uh, the Catholic Church, prior to that, of course, was responsible for the uh, protection of, of, um, of, of the poor. We, you know, even today, the Catholic Church has Catholic charities and so on. And so the English state 
became responsible for the uh, welfare of the poor. And um, so, so in Elizabeth, so Elizabeth uh, was Henry's um, daughter, and she became Elizabeth the first. And so in the latter half of the 16th century, you had a series of poor laws that were set up to, to aid the, the poorest of, of, the, of the community. Now, of course, there were two classes of poor under this system. There were the deserving poor and the undeserving poor. And of course, the undeserving poor were regarded as, as layabouts and criminals, and they 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 were they were locked up mostly. But the deserving poor got some some aid. Now this uh, situation um, continued, and then a, um, a a signal event happened. It was called the Glorious Revolution. It happened in 1688. Now that date, uh, King Charles came on the throne by succession. He happened to be a Catholic from Scotland. And of course, he wanted to turn the, the tide back and create a uh, Catholic religion. He also wanted, had a dalliance with France, who was one of England's enemies at the time. And so the parliament decided they really didn't like that. And so they put up, they created an army and kicked him out. And so that was the glorious revolution of kicking a king out um, and so so what they did they decided well we're, we're going to switch back we need a catholic we need a protestant king and so they asked um william of orange from holland to come over and be king which, which he did but in doing so they said well we, we've had enough of the tyrannical kings and so they decided you must um, sign the Bill of Rights, you see, which were their grievances about the past king. And there were 10 elements of the Bill of Rights. And of course, they were carried, and you see them today um, as the, the, the 10 amendments, the first 10 amendments to, to the Constitu American Constitution. So that's where they, they came from. So, but so our, over the next 100 years or so, you, the, the Protestant ethic gained ground. And, and of the most important part of the uh, Protestant ethic was individualism. And this, this of course, replaced the community transition, uh, community traditions that were part of the feudal era and, and, the, Catholic, and the Catholic Church. So this, that's, that's where the notion of, of American rugged individualism comes from. It's, it's this influence of the Protestant church. And also at that time, after a hundred years, we, Britain was entering into the uh, industrial revolution. And so you, and so you needed a, a new economics to, uh, to go along with that. And so they, they, it, it, they England threw up a lot of philosophers like Hume and uh, Adam Smith. And so they put together the, the basis of the free market, free trade ideology called classical economics that America, you know, many Americans love today, even though it's completely outdated. And so in, in 1776, along with the American Revolution, um, Smith, published his book, The Wealth of Nations. Now, this was a synthesis of, of, of these philosophies at, at the time. Now, of course, this, this religion and, and this uh, free market ideology was very attractive to the newly wealthy middle classes that had grown up in England because they, they, could, they loved it because they could pursue profit without government regulations. They could, they could do so without the strictures of the Catholic Church, you know, helping the poor and so on and so forth. And of course, the main point was they could engage in faith rather than deeds. So it was all about praying and have faith rather than doing anything. And of course, that was religion versus Christianity. And we see that notion today in America 
with people like Ted Cruz, who of course is deeply religious but profoundly unchristian. And so they, uh, they liked the accumulation of wealth via frugality. And, and this was willed by God. In fact, God had, uh, had the approval for doing this. Now, Adam Smith, in fact, was an opponent of the mercantile system because that involves state regulation and state charter and certain restrictions. So he was, it, so he was it didn't approve of that. He also uh, was a, an opponent of the local provision of store. That's to say, the provision of helping poor uh, governed and, and dispensed at the local level, because he said it, it impeded the free movement of labor. So he was all for sort of state control, centralized state control for that. But the big element of um, King of uh, Smith's uh, philosophy was the notion of the natural price. Now, the essence of the of, of Smith's uh, free market was there had to be multiple buyers and multiple sellers. And when these people interacted in the market, then the natural price would emerge out of it. Now, later on, a century or so later, uh, Alfred Marshall, who was Keynes' tutor in Cambridge in, in the late uh, 19th century, drew these supply-demand curves, and where they intersected, where supply you know meets demand, that's where the natural price occurs. In fact, Smith said there was a hidden hand that operated in the market. And so the market always created the optimum price level. Now, the requirements for this uh, market to operate are as follows. Number one, the product, the product must be reasonably identical uh, so that, so that they, they could all be you know, compared together. Uh, and the participants must be large, large in number. And so there, there must be equal product no, uh, knowledge on behalf of the buyer and the seller, the so-called arm's length transaction. Now, of course, it's doubtful whether any of these preconditions ever existed. They certainly don't exist today. Today, most products are, are plainly uh, not commodity items. They're not like sugar, which is supposedly the same but even even on commodity items you, you can have you know organically grown things apples you know different because they could they can be organically grown and then grown using pesticides so even even on commodities they can be different but today of course everything is carefully differentiated to offer some special advance advantage or feature and of course, the uh, the big thing about today's world, you certainly have uh, more and more um, agglomerations of companies, and so the economy of scale drives down the price, but it also tends to oligopolies and monopolies. So really, the the small, like for example, Walmart can go into a small town and completely drive out, you know, all the small businesses if it wants to, and often it does. And of course, advertising caters to the, to the emotional appeal of people and also engages in deceptive practices. And so when you come to uh, the modern financial markets, they operate under the notions of pump and dump followed by trash and cash. And so you see that that's how they all operate. And so most markets, in fact, are manipulated. I'd say almost every market is manipulated by, by, the, by the big money uh, contingents. And of course, the other thing that's gone on is, is all the um, financial regulations set in train by FDR, 1933 and four, have been uh, eliminated. The biggest one in the financial world is the repeal of the uptick rule. Now, what the uptick rule said, 
you couldn't short a, a stock or if the, um, unless the market was going up. Well, that was done away with on the, uh, in, in, the, uh, under, in, in the Clinton regime, because he said, well, the, you know, the markets can take care of every risk these days. Well, of course, we've seen that's totally untrue. And so you see, uh, really, the markets are, are manipulated by the large volume players. And of course, they love high volatility, and you see that. It's the the uh, volatility you see, especially in the Forex market, the foreign exchange market, is, which is like a, a three or four trillion dollars a day market. And that's totally manipulated. So you see, I mean, I. When I want to change money, you know, from dollars to pounds or dollars to the euro or something, you know, I, I and of course it goes up and down, and I do not understand with such swings, plus or minus, can be over a year, can be 30, 30 plus or minus percent, how you conduct conduct this trade because you know we, you're taking a huge risk in the swings of the way the the, the money exchange works unless you always trade in dollars. But the, um, so then we, we come to uh, free trade, which we discussed in the internal trade. And so of course, the, as I say, the, um, the age of mercantilism ended with the introduction of the Corn Laws in, the, in Britain in the 19th century, which removed charters and, it, and of course then introduction of the notion of free trade with no tariffs and so on. Although really every country is, has tariffs of one form or the other. Now, David Ricardo was an English uh, uh, economist of the late, of the late um, 19th century, and he came up with a notion of comparative advantage. And he showed mathematically that, that two countries would be better off if they rearranged their labor resources to adjust the proportion of labor used in various export industries. Uh, and he showed mathematically that this would be more beneficial to both. And this is called the uh, theory of comparative advantage. But really, it's, I mean, the notion that you're gonna move whole huge areas of, of the labor force round to create this is really absurd. And now, of course, of course, uh, since America just loves China so much. I mean, it basically China operates on the absolute advantage of cheap labor. So that's what really drives things today. The notion of this comparative advantage is really thrown out the window. But that was, that was really what, what uh, economists would was regard. I know uh, the, the main economics book in America you know, says that's the most wonderful thing that was ever created, this notion of um, comparative advantage. Well, basically, it's, it's untrue. And so what are the full impact of, of America's, what I call ideological inheritance, which is basically economics and religion? Now, of course, as I say, the full bag of it, you know, came, came to the US. And of course, the main thing is that the wealthy, of course, who always want to maximize wealth, um, can have a clear conscience of doing so, as I said, because the Protestant religion allows that. And of course, they, they always like the, to reduce regulations and government spending. They also promote the notion of the rugged individual. And of course, but, but of course, they love to impose their religious code or code on females, as, as we just see in Texas, and uh, we'll see across many other states uh, with regard to the abortion laws and so on. So we see rugged individual doesn't apply to women, according to the, the wealthy elite that uh, form the uh, GOP. And of course, they, uh, they have a great at saying that the welfare recipients are sponging off the state. And therefore, you know, and also that such payments, you know, take away from the will to work and so on. And of course, they blame the poor for their being poor and therefore unworthy of. And of course, if they'd all worked hard, they'd, they'd grow wealthy just, just like they, they would. 
And of course, neocons generally love classical economics, as pronounced by Adam Smith, and they reject Keynesianism, which does mean the control of, of, of the monetary system and, and fiscal controls. And of course, their notion is the market solves all problems. And so you don't need to have, you know, an, uh, an industrial policy or a national plan for anything because the market will always operate to control, to create the most optimum situation. Total nonsense, of course, because we saw in 1929, <clears throat> this wonderful edifice governed by the classical economics crash to the ground. And we saw another crash in 2008. And much of this crash was caused by um, the, the Clinton gang who removed most, most of, of the FDR's regulations and pandered to the banks. But it was when, when COVID-19 came along, there was no national plan, even though we knew that the, the bad viruses were coming. But of course the market was now. So, but you know, so you're not prepared, you know, the market's gonna, Cool, you know, it sticks. You know. So anyway, what so what have the results of the free trade philosophy been? Well, you know, the Thatcher and the Thatcher, Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan came in, and this what that's when the neocons really, really got going. You know, they they wheeled out all these uh, Ayn Rand philosophies and so on. And uh, we've had that for about the last 40 years, but so let's see what, what's happened. Well, of course, approximately 8 million manufacturing jobs have disappeared. And of course, the cumulative trade deficit, okay, is well over, it's probably 25 trillion. So what does that mean? Well, it means that America has had to sell roughly 25 trillion of its, of its assets to pay for it. And of course, now we see China buying up land in Texas and buying up businesses and stealing patents and so on and so forth. It's just been wonderful. In fact, I pinch myself, this is what this book was all about, you know, sabotaging America. I have to pinch myself that a country could be so dumb to allow this to happen. I just can't believe it. But of course, it goes along with the first two tenants described in America, greedy and stupid, actually. Um, and, and of course, the same thing could be said of England in many ways. So I, you know, I'm, I'm not got my down only in America and England has gone along with the same policy. And so the quality of goods that, you know, the wonderful goods that we paid so much for, you know, is in question. Their the reliability is not great. Their durability is not great. And their fit for purpose is very questionable. Now, I mean, I, I'm a, you know, a physicist by training, which means I can, do almost anything in, in uh, you know, elect electrical things and so on. So I always, and I own real estate, so I do a lot of work repairing air conditioning systems, especially in Dallas. Now in the old days, the, these uh, American made stuff would last you know, forever, it would last 20 years. So you never saw a capacitor fail or a contactor fail. Nowadays, the first thing you look at the basic guy will tell you, he always checks the capacitors because they're made in China and they don't last more than a year. It's sometimes only months. Same thing with contacted. So, you know, and, you know my, I, I bought my wife a, um, a digital radio so she could listen to Radio Helsinki and, and so on. And uh, its warranty was 90 days and that's how long it lasted, 90 days. I mean, that's unheard of, but it's these junk parts that we co that come from China. Well, and of course now we have junk food and we have junk pharmaceuticals coming from China. So, I mean, I hope you don't get ill and relying on pharmaceuticals because they're very questionable components. And big pharma will never tell you where these parts come from, these constitute, constitutional elements come from, in fact. But you know, they come from very, very dubious sources. Very dubious sources, sources. And of course, the other thing, you have product labels um, 
never tell you the country of origin or they lie about it. For example, Egyptian cotton was, beckoned, was reckoned to be the best cotton in the world. But of course, now we have these supply chains, it passes through middleman and middleman to middleman. And while it does so, uh, Egyptian cotton gets mixed with every other kind of rubbish cotton. And so this is why the quality of, of fabrics is not what it used to be. So even though it says Egyptian cotton on it. Now there is a company in New Zealand called Oritane that can actually spot frauds by doing element analysis on, on these goods. And so they found out that uh, horse meat has been mixed into beef, so-called beef patties. They found that the sugar syrup is blended into organic honey. They found out that New Zealand lamb chops come from Chinese feedlots. They found out that extra virgin oil is cut with cheap inferior oil. They found out that t-shirts stitched with cotton grown and on forced labor farms. And so the counterfeit food business in America is now worth 50 billion a year. So, I mean, we're, we're getting rubbish goods, rubbish food and rubbish pharmaceuticals. So America is really being fleeced. And I don't blame China in the least. All, all I do blame is the CEOs of, Amer of multinational American corporations and the Dimwick Congress that has done this. It's the same con Congress that stood, you know, when Britain was facing Germany, that stood back for two years saying, oh, oh, Britain is going to, and, and Ken Kennedy, Joseph Kennedy said, well, Britain's going to fail, so don't. No, don't help them out. It's the same Congress, the dimwits even today won't pass uh, Biden's laws that are going to help the poor. No, can't do that. And you have these dimwits in, in, in you know, cinema and uh, mansion and helping the, you know, helping the wealthy along. It's, it's quite a disgrace, actually. Um, so, so, Anyway, so Oratam, this company in New Zealand, can actually detect illegal fishing by looking at the lead content because it changes you know, from ocean to ocean. Now, there's a, a company called Nokia, not Nokia. In fact, Nokia was buying other companies' chocolate and presenting it as a tasting experience sourced from the best chocolate producing countries of Venezuela and the Ivory Coast. And of course, it was, it was, again, counterfeit, and they sold it 10 times the price to Neiman Marcus in Dallas. So that fraud was exposed. And there was 1,500 tons of Italian kiwi fruit, which is passed off of the superior French kind. And so, of course, the uh, US public has, has now become aware of these long supply chains, which of course of course, we, causes lots of bottlenecks, and is responsible for some of the shells not being stocked these days very much. And of course, responsible for most prices going up, in fact. So I'm not in favor of this globalization and so on and so-called free trade. Um, and of course, of course, the, uh, the public are aware now of these uh, supply chain uh, bottlenecks, but they're not aware of these middlemen committed absolute fraud on the goods that are coming in. And of course, the wonderful Bill Clinton, who ushered in China into the WTO, said that the China trade deal was a 100 to 1 win-win. Well, of course, he would say that. And so how can you tell a politician is lying? Well, it's easy. Her lips are moving, as they were with Clinton and his gang. And so what is today's political reality in America? Well, of course, one expects the Republicans to look after their backers, you know, the money to leave. But one expects the Democrats to do better for the working class. They do not. So Hillary, of course, 
called the working class who voted for Trump deplorables. The real deplorables are the corporate CEOs who sold out America and the Wall Street swindlers who committed fraud and were bailed out. So several pundits lately have said the working class are more conservative than, than the liberal Democrats, the liberal elite Democrats, and therefore they, they moved to Trump because he promoted the, the more, more, more conservative view. And so this culture over economics theory has a point, but both Clinton and Obama, you know, Democrat presidents, enacted policies that were counter to the interests of the working class. In fact, they, they moved to the center. They are really GOP light. Just as Tony Blair in England, head of the Labour Party, was really Tory light, that's to say, right wing in, in all of his views. And of course, the Affordable Care Act and the expanded earned income tax credit were achievements under Obama. But both Clinton and Obama permitted the power of the working class to degrade. They stood by as corporations crushed the trade unions, which is the backbone of working class leverage. And the, these free trade agreements were provided. Um, and of course, millions of blue collar jobs were lost without replacement jobs um, being created or even funded for retraining and so on. It was just tough luck, fella, goodbye. And no wonder the working class is so fed up, you know, disenchanted really with both parties. I would be too. In fact, I am. And of course, trade union men membership sank from 22% of all workers when Clinton came into office, and today it's about 11%. And that, of course, denies the working class of any bargaining power. And so the, the, the Obama administration protect, protected Wall Street from the consequence of, its, of the casino operations on Wall Street by a taxpayer funded bailout that let millions of homeless, homeowners lose their homes. So both Clinton and uh, Obama ignored antitrust laws, allowing major industries to concentrate and become more politically powerful. And Democrat senators back the big money people and had they refused to support like mansion and so on, support paid family leave and big money has killed labor law reforms. Finally, they, enact, they failed to enact real campaign finance reform. And Obama never followed up on his re-election campaign promise to pursue a constitutional amendment overturning Citizens United versus FEC. Of course, that was the, uh, so Citizens United did away, and so the, by the, this idiot Supreme Court that we have today, and has allowed vast sums of money to flow into uh, politics. And so the totality of free trade, shrinking unions, Wall Street bailouts, growing corporate power, and the abandonment of combined finance reform has shifted political and e economic power to the wealthy. The working class has been ignored, and the Democrats have and will pay the price, especially, I think, in this upcoming election in, in November. So adjusted for inflation, American workers today are earning about the same as they did 30 years ago, while the American, e when the American economy was one third its present size. All the gravy and the cream has gone to the top. They've taken everything. So Biden's agenda for the working people, including lower prescription drug prices, paid family leave, stronger unions and free community college have been killed by the power of big money. Big Pharma has blocked prescription drug reform. A handful of Democratic centers 
the senators, backed by big money, have refused to support paid family leave. Big money has killed labor reform, law reform, labor, labor law reform. So we've had a societal breakdown here. So life has become much more precarious for those who were called essential workers on, the, on, the, on this minimum wage of $8 an hour and $2.13 if you're a waitress uh, and so on. You know, that's a national disgrace. And, and, and so these workers were seen to be you know, important. But really, their safety and so on was, you know, was, was unimportant. So their education and re-education needs have always been insufficient. Healthcare has been neglected and housing substandard. Like at, you know, like at this fire that happened, you know, in New York, there were no sprinkler systems built in 1972, by the way. And so violence has become commonplace in this doggy -e dog world where compassion is regarded as a weakness. The gun craze driven by the GOP is a social madness and a total misinterpretation of the US Constitution, actually, on the Second Amendment. And this, this curse of social media has fermented hatred and disinformation to maximize profits. It's disgusting, and I would shut the damn thing down if it were me. It's no one of the opioids or the last resort of diminished workers who've been worn down by a system that placed them on the human scrap heap with no place of refuge. The sight of elderly, elderly people pushing supermarket carts for eye candy wives is a national disgrace. The young people have had their future stolen from, stolen from them by the moneyed class who have no noblesse or bleach and are generally society's parasites. To regain, to regain any credibility, Democrats must end their financial dependence on the big corporations, Wall Street and the wealthy. The productive sector must be revitalized and the non-productive parasitic sector must be curtailed. Somehow, somewhere there must be a government that cares about its people and is a and is a government of the people by the people and for the people to quote abraham lincoln now what we have is a government controlled by big money that serves only the financial interests of big money and does not give a damn about the least fortunate Thank you. That ends my talk for tonight. I will entertain questions. So I don't know who controls. Tim has left this. No, he's come back. Um, so I've finished my talk. So I, I'm, I will entertain any and all questions. Yes, and I'm sorry. Oh, yes, what is the time, please? I uh, was basically uh, taking care of my... Uh, that new cat was giving me some trouble here. Um, anyway, so oh. I was away from my screen for a little bit. Um, okay, anyway. I'll be waiting. All right, so we're, we're entering all questions and everything else. So if you have a question, now is the time to ask. Go ahead and unmute and- uh, I've got uh, one. Uh, go go right ahead and start asking away. Okay, I've. Um, thanks, John. Uh, you know, I agree with you basically on the problem uh, and your history. Uh, um, the question is, what do we do, you know? And one thought is, do you think it's any better in England or China or, you know, what are the best practices? I know it seems this neocon, neoliberal takeover by capitalism has broken the social contract worldwide, and um, which I call fascism, but I, I don't know how to stop it. What are your ideas for that? Well, um, as you know, um, during the um, five years after the uh, Second World War in England, uh, um, we, we had the full welfare state introduced. Um, Thatcher and the Tory party 
have done their very best to dismantle it. But we still have the National Health Service that it operates. It's underfunded. Right now, we have this moron, Boris Johnson, actually, who hopefully will be kicked out because he's made a total pig's, <laughs> pig's breakfast of, of, of his time in office. But, uh, and is seen to be a, the moron that he is, actually. So we still have the National Health Service. Um, we had um, free education all the way through college. My, my education, you know, my three degrees, you know, uh, were all paid for by um, the LCC, London County Council. Uh, that's no longer true. And so Tony Blair introduced you know, payment for college. It's not as, as much as America, but it, it may well eliminate some of the poorest who happen to be some of the brightest, actually. And we do need them. Every country need, needs them. Uh, the last thing, of, of course, is housing. And of course, now in Britain, we're selling our houses off to the Chinese. I mean, that's one of our best money. You know, if you sail along the Thames at night, you, you see all these towers, new towers with, with very expensive apartments going from 50 to 100 million bucks. And most of the lights are, turned, you know, are not lit because they're, they're, these happen to be piggy banks for all the criminal class in, around the world, including China, Russia, and every, everything else. So again, we're, we're selling our, and, every, and almost every week in England, they sell off another business, okay, to overseas buyers. As you know, the car industry is totally foreign. I mean, it's been a total disaster under Thatcher. It, she started it, and uh, I hated her guts. She was a vile person, and a dimwit as well. So, but, so I mean, I have an equal disdain for most of what's gone on in England in the last uh, 40 years or so. Now, what can we do, which is your, um, well, you know, the big thing we, we need in this country is, is a Labour Party that actually supports the, and, and tends to the needs of the average working American, actually, to make sure he actually gets a fair deal. And as you know, I, I believe in employee ownership, where, where the employees vote in who is going to be the CEO and, and the top officers, you know, and, and sit on the board of directors. And when a guy screws up, he's kicked out. And so, you know, so, and in, in for example, in John Lewis in England, who owned Waitrose, about 150,000 workers, I mean, they have a, they have a, um, a journal and you can ask questions of the man, why did you do this? You know, and and the, the top people, the top officers must answer actually to the, to the lowest guy on, on, on the totem pole. And that's true industrial democracy or economic democracy. And so, you know, I, you know, I promote, you know, economic democracy, which means that everyone has a say in the operation of their own livelihood. And, you know, I, I, you know, in America, we do not have a proper, you know, vocational training in the high school and beyond. And so, and it's all left up for these for-profit colleges, which fleece, often fleece people. And so they're not really properly trained to, to, uh, to do well in the world. And if they, if they are trained, it, you know, if you go to a, you know, a Yale or whatnot, it, it costs the earth unless you can get a scholarship or something. And, and so we need, we need the best and the brightest actually. And America certainly needs the best and the brightest. But we certainly got in CEOs. I mean, I've worked in major corporations, you know, especially in Dallas here. I've never seen any, any brilliance there. I've seen a lot of hot air. And, uh, and of course, the, 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 you know, and so it's strange that the top echelons always read these progress reports that I used to write, and they were a pack of lies by the time they got up through the chain. And so, and it, these guys would never deign to come down and speak to the, you know, the peasant on, on the shop floor. They'd be, be beneath their dignity to do that. And so, you know, so really, you know, I would say we, we need. We really do need a, a we need a you know a a labor party that supports the interest of labor, and we do need industrial democracy where everyone has a say. And, uh, but you have to change the economics, you see, and you can tell how everyone affects the bottom line. And I I, pro I promoted once a system whereby you can do that, so you get paid for 
your effect and your effectiveness on, on the bottom line. And, and so that will actually, uh, so we'll, so people need to have a say in, in, in what goes on because they, they, they work at the coal face, you know, they, they, they're digging all the coal. They, they're the ones that know the defects of products and so on. And, um, would you agree? You know, when, I, when I was is a part sorry, of just, just to finish. Sorry, it's just to finish my, my train of thought. When I was in Xerox, I mean, I had 1.300 people working for me and we put out products. And I said to everybody, look, I don't know everything, you don't know everything, but if something goes wrong, you have to come to, immediately to me, immediately, and we'll, we'll fix it. And, that, then I, and I used to draw on, on expertise from around Xerox to form, form tiger teams to, to solve problems. You know, and so and and we all stayed together for twenty years and uh, put out good products, and we always met the budget. And I I warned the people above me to lay off my people and don't touch me and fire me if we fail. But we never failed because I had good people and I made sure they were paid well as well as I could do in in, uh, in my allowances. So you know you have to have management that cares about people actually and. You know, and not mo and many managements are just the tyrants. Actually, you know, they insult their workers and treat them badly, and expect to get good re good results. Well, naturally, they don't. But this hierarchical system, you see, which I deplore, and you know, ensures that you, you know, and so on. So really, you you have to have you know, as I say, a proper in industrial democracy, and you have to have. You know, you have to you have to make sure the three pillars of you know, society, like ed, ed, you know, education, healthcare, and housing, are taken care of. <laughs> and this country is rich enough to make sure that happens, actually. And so that is not is not just a shimmer. You know, it, it can be done. America is wealthy enough to make sure it, it does happen. And really, for the future of America, it's got to happen because you know, you, you 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 now have you know. The rise of China and, and, and a nascent Russia and so on. So you, America does have enemies who, who want to see, want to ferment problem and dissension. Okay. So anyway, so that's basically what I'd say. Form, try and form a Labour Party that really is for the people, and then okay. part of that would be industrial democracy. All right. I guess Question. Janice. Janice has her hand raised next, and then I think Raj has a question. Correct, Raj? Yeah. All right, Janice. Okay, okay Janice. Janice, we're ready. Uh, she's not. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, um, my. Oh. oh, I thought I put my audio. Uh, start video. Okay. Um, yeah. Here's my question. At the very beginning, John, you talked about the economic depression, and then you were speaking about a book, which I certainly didn't get. I think you held, I heard the name of the book or the author's name, uh, but it was enough for you to recommend it, but you didn't give us any Oh, well, it, it, it was naturally, it, it was my book. book but anyways, the basic question is- It's called, it's called, it's called, it's called Sabotaging America, which is, um, but anyway- Sabotaging yeah, America. Me. Who's the author? And so you- You, you wrote Me. It. I wrote oh, okay. It, it was, I, I don't really go into okay. self-promotion, <laughs> but right. you know, it's- <laughs> Thank it's you for that. Read and, and, <laughs> If you like, okay, if you so like that's why you what I concentrate on it. Okay. Yeah. If you like what I said tonight, there, there are far more. <laughs> uh, okay. Anyways, details, you started talking about the 2008 economic dep dep depression, but I don't think you closed the circle because but, you never returned to that. I mean, you went back to 10,066 and you know, and all the English <laughs> history. And by the way, in, in in, in U.S. books that are written in Texas, by the way, and so they're they're kind of yeah. biased. Uh, it tells biased. us that um, uh, that the Industrial Revolution started in the United States uh, with uh, Eli Whitney and his uh, uh, you know water driven uh, something or other. I forget what it was. <laughs> mill, some sort of mill. Um, uh, not in England. Well. <laughs> 
Well, of course, we don't um, promote England in our textbooks. <laughs> well, well, naturally, but you know, it's um, it's generally recognized that the, you know, the um, you know, the real it was really the, the capitalist system, the funding that got going because America really was primarily an agricultural system in the late uh, you know 18th century, um, and so you know, but I won't go into that. Actually, my book talks about that, so so it. it there's a lot in the book which, um, you know, which I skipped over, and and you asked about the 2008 crash. Well, I go into that in in great detail in, in this book. So it's a it's a pretty good read if you want to uh, understand the. See, I'm I'm my main interest in life is socioeconomics, how the society work with respect to economics, and of course you must if you want a good society, you have to have good economics. And, and and some people will remember that some okay. time back I gave a talk. Sorry. Um, okay, let me finish. I gave a talk about Helmarsh okay. Act. Helmarsh Act, who was a, um, a, a the the economist who uh, turned around Germany in in in, um, in from 1933 um, to uh, to about 1936. In about three four years, he actually turned around and and. Made a made a economic powerhouse out of Germany, which is a, rem a remarkable achievement. But but he used very very um, you know, revolutionary electric. You know, it, it was it was because it was controlled. But I gave a talk about that, you see, which which Americans would do well to 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 um, read about actually. So um, sorry. Anyway, so okay. Uh, let me understand. <laughs> Let me understand what you just said. Mm -hmm. okay. um, that uh, 2008, okay, is covered in your book. You mentioned it. You didn't go back to it in your talk. Um, but what it what it really is is that uh, 2008 was brought down by the uh, moneyed class, and I guess that's what you concentrated upon. Yes, I mean, I, in, in, in short, what happened was it was a um, you know, it was a boom. It was it was the boom brought on by by the by the housing boom. You know, um, and so money was poured in and poured in and interest until the rates day too. Came. And, yeah, and, and higher interest. But the day came when and when LIBOR the economy and, and well the LIBOR well, the LIBOR was totally different. That's that's the London um, that that was the LIBOR rate or you know. Again, I I, I touched on the finance. Yeah, but they cheated. Uh, gambling they cheated. In, 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 in the forehead. But let's go back to the 2008. Actually, <laughs> That's the point. actually, actually, what we've seen, what we've seen under this neocon regime, every eight years we we had a boom and a bust, and a boom and a bust. Um, which I said, you know, you have a boom, and all the all the rich money pours in, and then. And then they suddenly withdraw their money, and you have a bust, uh, because because all, all the all the financial controls have been done away with, and so you you can you know, and so and so that's what you have every almost right. every eight years. So that's why I put in the hmm. a comment that we need regulation, and I hope everybody asks well, for regulation of our financial systems. Yeah, well, as I said, I made a point that the Money class uh, want want deregulation, and they got it under under Clinton actually, and and uh, Robert Rubin. I mean, he he came from Wall Street, and so the, the, the financial criminals did very well. They committed fraud and got away with it actually. So, you know, and so you know you, you and so yeah, you 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 must have a, a you know. So basically, I mean, anyway, so. As I say, I, I covered the, the crash of two, you know, in this book, which I recommend reading. Really, um, I go over that what happened in detail. I also go over, you know, how 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 uh, Lord Keynes was, was totally ignored, and uh, that had a has had a calamitous consequence. But that's another talk, you see. And I can do many well, you talks. Also but, Let's Showed us another book called Anglo Social History. Okay. Um, yeah. you, all right. Okay. All right, Janice, Next question, you, 
All right, Raj, go ahead. Uh, John, uh, you're talking about glorious yesterday and uh, things are not as good. For whom? I mean, I, I know 40, 50 years back, uh, I, uh, the lots of people were still working on a farm and work, having a job in a, in a factory and still work. The blacks are blacks were in a better shape. Now blacks are in a better shape. Women are in a better shape. Gays are in a better shape. We are a black president, and education is more everywhere. Is there? And I see more and more people getting educated, and so they were, they understand what's going on more than 50, 40, 50 years back. And uh, work, working class people are better now. They, they, they don't have to deal with union boss and, and a mess of the thing. And people are not working in a steel mills and uh, factories. People are working on a computer. So it's, it's a hell of a better job working in a factory, working in a nice office or home than in a factory like your steel or a, a, the car factory. It's a, everything has changed for better. And uh, what I can see is that that China, thanks to China, that American family, average American income family, have a furniture at home, they have a computer, at, color computer at home, and they have a nice phone, you know, and almost a computer, they have everything they want. I mean, do you, do you really think, I, I, let me say, I do not think that American, American middle class and American lower middle class would have a quality of life without China that they have now. Okay, I'll stop there. Well, what I what I would say to, what I would say to you is, in this game, there there are always winners and losers. Okay. Um, yes, the the well educated people in America have, have done quite well. I mean, I, I I've done quite well. Okay, I mean, with, with my various degrees and, and so on. So, so I'm not I'm not worried about the, the you know the uh, what we call the, the middle class you know the, the well educated section of, of, of the country. What what I as a um, because I I count myself as totally totally unreligious, but I do count myself as a Christian. I do care about the the, the working people. Okay, and that what we've seen is, you know, this 18, the eight bucks an hour or so is, is derisory. And many, many women are left on their own with children and they can, they can scarcely make it. Okay, now the, the people who live on tips, okay, because of, of the national, they're not the NRA, the National Restaurateurs Association, the, wage, the wages they get is $2.13 an hour. So, so they re re rely upon tips for their income. So when I eat out, which I do quite a bit, I always give at least 20, 25% because I know that's their wages. Now, you know, from what I, you know, from what I've heard and what I see, because uh, I see I see a lot of working people. You know, they are not they they are not living high off the hog. Their kids are not being properly well educated. They don't have the opportunities that the, the wealthier people do, because they can't you know they can't take a chance. And and even even the middle class, who who you know getting a degree even a degree in America is, is four years. Okay, in England it's it, you, it's three years, because in high school in England, you, you typically take two or three subjects. And so by the time you get to college, uh, start college, you're halfway through an American degree when you're 18. And so, and of course, a lot of people from, from India and, and like, I was talking to a lady from Singapore who said they have the British system of education. They take O levels and A levels set by, uh, University of London and so on, and, and that's a gold standard for them. Now, 
as I say, I'm not worried about the wealthy elite and, and the middle and the wealthy and middle class, educated class in this country. Yes, they've all done well. But, but what I'm saying to you is most of these goods that come into America are shoddy. And one of my friends, I was I, you know, um, from Xerox, you know, about the same age as me, um, bought a, um, a a jacket, you know, like jacket from L, was it L.L. L. Bean or I think it's got L.L. Bean, and he remarked how thin it was compared to ones he bought before. And I did point out, this is the thesis of America, that the, the the lowering of the quality of life. I mean, especially this violence. I mean, I characterize three things in America, you know, greed, stupidity, and violence. Whatever happens, it's, you know, because of the, that, those three things, one or other of those three things. Um, and violence has got worse and worse. The, the, gun, the gun craze has got worse and worse. I mean, you know, you know when I grew up in England, I, I never saw a gun. No, nobody had guns. You know, it is unheard of. My, you know, because of the Second Amendment, which, which was a war, actually the, 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 as part of the, um, the Bill of Rights, you know, in, from England, actually, because it was there so the Protestants could, could protect themselves against the Catholics. Um, but, but anyway, it's lunacy. It's absolute lunacy. And so, you know, as I say, you know, it's it because right after the war, you know, look, my four of the four, I mean, there was no social, there was no housing. A third of the houses had disappeared. And so we at the end of the war, 1944, we were evacuated to the country by mother and sister and grandmother. So when we came back, there was no housing. So the four of us lived in one room for at least two years. And uh, in the cold winter, of, there was no coal. We were basically almost froze to death. Okay. Now, no. So, so I and so, it was our poorest relative that put us up. So I have a feeling as to what 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 being poor is like. Okay. So I I always feel sympathy for the poorest, and that's what being a Christian is. Okay. Now, I, I maintain that America is not, well, two things. It's not a democracy for a start, and, and it's not a Christian country. If it were a Christian country, uh, uh, everybody in America would be taken proper care of. And they're not. And they're not. There was no, uh, and I wasn't referring back to some glorious age. I talked about the glorious revolution, but that was 1688. <laughs> it certainly wasn't glorious. But, but it's, called, it's called the Glorious Revolution because the Catholic King was, was, was removed. And so, yes, I mean, um, there are social problems in America. Um, and so, but it, it, all, it all has to do with reforming the social economic system, actually. All right, Brian. And so, and, and so that, that is what I have said and what I would do to reform the, the social economic system. Okay. Uh, can, I, can, I, can I, would you grant, at least grant? Yeah, please go ahead and finish your question. Hello. Would, would you at least grant to me uh, that as a whole, population is doing better? And since you bring uh, the Christian thing uh, three, four times, so I need to ask you that a Christian's are the problem because uh, you know they they have been hating they've been keeping women back they've been keeping gays back they've been keeping blacks back and they are the problem since 19 since ronald reagan's time and they are still problem okay they are still blocking oh. the progress in society so i mean this is my last this is this is here i am i will not okay. be talking anymore Okay. okay. Well, you see, you see, we, we have what we have in America. We have the great masquerade, you see, which is going to part and parcel of a, of a new book I'm writing. You know, we, we have religious people masquerading as Christians. Um, you know, it's, in fact, the evangelicals 
often called Chris, the Christian evangelicals. Well, they're the furthest thing from Christians you could possibly imagine, actually, when you look at their how they behave and and their, their philosophy. Okay. Um, you know, so uh, so anyway, so so that answers the distinction. You know, yes, people are pretending to be Christians and masquerading as Christians, but in reality, as, as I mentioned, the Protestant religion is more about faith and believing God than doing good works, actually. And so that's that's where this notion you know, come, came from, and I, I stress that. Now, um, but anyway, um, you know, it, it was man. It was man. Let me back up. It was mandatory in England, you know. So, so religious instruction that was mandatory. Maybe, maybe it still is in England. So we all we all had to read the Bible. There was religious uh, um, assembly every every morning and so on, and we all sang prayers, and we all said the Lord's prayer, and so I read the Bible, uh, you know, and and of course there are two sections: so the Old Testament. That's really just the history of the Jews. And there's the New Testament. Well, the Old Testament is just history, and most of it is about killing and so on and so forth. Uh, but as it has nothing to do with Christianity. The Christianity is, is, is what... Uh, and of course, uh, uh, Jesus actually was taken back to the Far East okay, when he was young. So much of his, his religion came from, from the Far East. He was, he was brought back. Okay, and when he died, after he died, he was he was buried back in the far east. Actually, there's there's his grave, and so that's where that's where much of his philosophy came from. Actually, the far east. Okay. It, it, so, so it didn't. All right, John, we got another didn't. questioner. We got. Okay. We got, all right. All right, Brian, you've had your hand up for a while, so go ahead, please. I I think Charlie was before me. Well, uh, Charlie, do you want to go first, or I don't see Charlie in here right now. Yeah, go ahead. Go uh, ahead, Brian. Okay, okay Brian, thanks. Go ahead. I'll lower your head, and then we'll let Charlie go next. All right. Um, so I have a couple of comments and a question. So comment one is America is a constitutional republic. It's not a democracy. It never was. Majority rule. Uh, is akin to mob rule. And that's why when our founders created the country, they, they gave the federal government limited and enumerated powers. Um, the, <clears throat> the power to regulate firearms is not among those powers. Um, <clears throat> so there's that. <clears throat> um, the, the unalienable right of the people to bear arms, that is uh, <clears throat> stated in our Declaration of Independence, uh, our unalienable right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And liberty <laughs> entails the right to defend yourself against uh, tyranny. Um, <clears throat> America is a non-religious country. There is no official religion. Um, it's it's not, not a Christian country. <clears throat> All right, so now my question. The, <clears throat> the U.S. Went, went off the gold standard in 1973. There was Roosevelt confiscated all the gold in, I think, 1934, and then we were on the gold standard until 1973 when Nixon closed the gold window. At that point, the, the creation of money uh, was made through fair, fractional reserve banking and government deficit spending. So, and, and it basically put the, the power to create money in the hands of private bankers who issue currency for their own benefit. Um, and that our, our money creation has gone like just a 90 degree um, since 1973, the, the amount of money in circulation that's been created has been um, just proportionally more and more and more and more is created every year. So, um, to what extent do you think that coming off of the gold standard has contributed to this social and economic woes that you speak of? Yes, uh, I, I, I would say that, um, that see, um, America came off the gold standard, um, but it, 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 
really had a very peculiar system, and it certainly wasn't uh, Keynesian economics. Now, if you wanted, see, I gave a talk about Helmar Schacht, actually, a few months ago in Dallas, and um, it was interesting. He controlled the money supply by giving credits to, um, to corporations for goods sold, okay? So, so the economy in Germany expanded without um, inflation because the money supply increased with the productive power of the country. When, when now, you say credits, what do you America, mean credits? Could you explain that a little bit? Okay. Um, okay. It was, it, okay, this credit was really the same as money. They could go back to the Deutsche Bank and get money, you see. But what, what, what it did was, you see, that it basically was a form of payment for the production of goods by the state. Uh, to, to the corporations. So, so that, was, that was a way the money supply, you see, was increased. That was the monetary system. So, so like, like, sovereign, like sovereign money, like the, the government issued the well, currency directly. Yes. He, 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 well, because it was a to totalitarian state, he could do this. Um, and he also did the thing, set the similar thing with foreign trade. I mean, you know, I mean, I, I need to give a whole, it, I took an hour to go through this actually to explain what it did, but it was remarkable. And, and of course, while the whole Western world was shattered for 10 years because of this 29 crash, Germany was able to recover in, in, in the space of three years by its policies. I mean, he was truly a remarkable economist actually, what he did. And he also is, well, I won't go into his trade policies, but they were also effective and and so, and, and of course, many come in you know, after about 1935 or six, many companies wanted to trade with Germany because they had the money, actually. Was, and so, you know, because I knew, you know, from the history that Germany recovered. And I, I, so years ago, I asked my question, how did it happen? So that's why I, well, who was the architect of it? And so I, I came across the name Helmar Schacht. Well, because he, you see, he was well known with Montague Norman, who was the governor of the Bank of England in the 30s. And uh, so I was aware. So anyway, what he did was, so anyway, the answer to your question is, the money supply must always increase in relationship to the production of the country. And, there, and the, when that happens, you won't have inflation. Now, when as a country, you export your manufacturing base, Okay, as America's done, you know, you, the money supply, you know, increases, but of course it's without, it's not going commensurate with the productive power of America. And that's one of the reasons why you had this great inflation. But the recent rise is, you know, is totally because of this supply chain bottlenecks and so on and so forth, and, and the greed of, of the taking advantage of the situation. So yes, you see, you can run a country, but you must, to do so, you must have very effective monetary, monetary, monetary controls and fiscal controls both. And if you do so, and you control it properly, but it does take government control of both things. Now the right wing doesn't believe in any control, okay? They believe the free market will take care. Well, it's total nonsense, of course as they believe in, in classical economics. But as I say, um, if, you, if you're able to control, as I, and I think explain that, so I don't, I don't want to reiterate myself, but that's a means of, of gaining prosperity, controlling the money supply without inflation and so on. So I, I just want to make uh, one, one point. The, um... It's just more of an observation that, that these PPP loans that they issued last year and the, I don't know if they did it in 2020, but a lot of those got forgiven. Like it was, um, you know, money was actually deposited in the, these, you know, businesses accounts and then the loan was forgiven. So it, in effect, it was just the creation of money. I mean, it's like the government just created money and gave it to businesses. I mean, the U S government did this like just last year. So just one is well, but as I say, when you do this, you see, 
without these controls that I, I'm talking about, obviously it will lead to inflation. So that's what you've seen. And the fact that so many people left the workforce, you know, and so they weren't productive, was another factor. So there, there are many factors actually in the economy that, that, that has caused this rise in inflation. Um, but as I say, you must have twin control of, of the twin levers of the economy, the, the monetary system and the fis fiscal system. If either one gets out of hand, then you're in trouble. But so, it, it, it does mean, it does mean a, a lot of government control, actually. Well, and, and there is the a problem. I mean, you can't trust government. Well, I mean, you give them control and they're going to well, do some shenanigans. That's what they've done. They do it every single time. Well, I mean, decentralize, you know, take power away from the government, restore the rights of the people and limit the power of government to what it, it should be. Um, yeah. And so that the government well, uh, rules by consent, which it does not. But, you know, that's... You know, that's look. I I believe in 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 decentralized power to, to a degree, but when you're talking about that's microeconomics, okay, that's a whole different topic. But when you get into the macroeconomic arena, which is where Keynes came in, then you have to have central control of it. Really, it it, it just has to be now. I don't now, know that you you look, need centralized gonna, control of the currency. Yeah, People should just agree on what has value. Man, controlling the state. Never mind. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Okay. Um, let let me say this. Look. Let me say this. Um, there must be okay. In other in other countries, there are such people as as ombudsmen. You know, if you really if you really do disagree with with the way. You know, the thing is, one of the things is, is I totally disagree with the American Constitution. Okay? I mean, it's set up to be undemocratic. It's set up to cause huge money to flow into it. Okay, You know, the, the cost of American election are 10 times what it, what it takes to, to elect the same amount of government as in England and, and 100 times what it takes in Japan. And so this big money corrupts the whole the whole system, um, you know. And so, look, you must have effective democracy. You must have um, you must have a press that really, you know, really does look to see where the money's going. And and actually, you know, look, look what I would do: the first article of any new constitution would be the corruption of of democracy. If any government official steals, you know, from from the people, I would I would I would lock them up as if they were murderers, actually, because that that destroys democracy. So but I mean, under this system, yeah, yeah. So you know, it's you know, okay. but that's what goes on. I mean, you, you basically have high level corruption because of the um, the constitution. And, and thankfully, the people have the ability to address it via, uh, you know, people have the right to, to bear arms. I mean, and one of the right, one of the reasons, the purposes of that right is to prevent tyranny, to give the people the, the opportunity well, to respond. We haven't had that. Well, you see, what, you, what you're saying, what you're saying is that basically you, 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 you're, you're turning towards a fascist system. So you, you must rely upon the people to storm the government and, and overthrow it. Well, you know, good luck for that situation. But, it, but it's not and, that. And by the it's, way, it's that uh, the yeah. people, armed people right. who right. don't want to be governed, won't be governed. All right. Jim Crosstalk. I think you're right. Now we're going to have to uh, keep moving on. John, uh, if you could compact your answers a little bit more. we got three questioners. I'm going to let Charlie. Yeah, okay, I'm sorry. Oh, I'll, 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 I'll All right, and then I'm going to let Dan and Alana go because they, they haven't had a question yet. And then, Alana, you're on your second one, so we'll uh, go in that order if you don't mind. So, Charlie, please go ahead. Okay. Yeah, where's Brian? This is for him, actually. But it's, tell me, John, if my assessment is correct. The Republican Party tell all these yahoos, vote for us. 
and we'll guarantee that you can keep your guns. And if you vote Democratic, they're going to take away your guns. And according to the speaker the other day at the other college, while the Republicans were saying, oh, we're going to let you keep your weapons, they turned around and raised taxes on the 99%, except for the 1%. So I don't understand this. Don't they understand they're being fleeced, swindled? They say, you can keep your guns. And then they turn around and they take money out of their wallets. And these guys say, that's great. It, you know what? It, it's uh, let you keep your guns. See, that's the whole thing, right? It's it's your unalienable right to arm yourself and, and for defense of persons hey, and property. It's, you're not speaker. letting someone do anything. God is the They're speaker. infringing on your nat on your oh, yeah. natural let's, rights. Let's let's, let's uh, keep this down because that's Charlie and uh, John right now answering questions. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay. You got to know. Uh, John, we'll, we'll be know, the, um, um, to you. Go the, ahead. Uh, the amazing, the amazing thing with all these guns, I think that something like two or three guns for every citizen in America. Yeah, it's actually, crazy. The, the numbers go. I mean, to, the I amazing thing is, that, the amazing thing is that so many people are left alive in America. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like, that's like that's all. Home. Basically, that's all I can say. It, you know, look. U.S.A. U.S.A. Well, <laughs> well you know, the, the, idea, the idea that you have to resort to a gun to, to get democratic government seems to be you know, a <laughs> preposterous notion, actually. It does really mean the failure of, of, of the whole democratic system. Actually. Have you seen world Which history? Think, have you looked at history? I'm, I'm just saying, take a look. Course. Um, look, I have a question. Brian, I gave a talk on revolution. All right. Okay. Another question. In my lecture. I have, I have a, another history. question. Mm -hmm. I gave a lecture on it, the history of revolutions. So yes, I have. Yeah. And keeping weapons. Another question is not it. I, uh, I'm. Uh, my name's Luke Matthews. I'm here with Ellen Corley. I have a a, a pretty simple question. Um, John, thank you for your talk. Um, um, it's my belief, and I've lived in Europe and, and lived here most of my life, that the economic opportunities are greater here than they are in Europe, specifically in the UK where I lived. And um, I think the standard of living uh, in general is higher here than in the UK and in uh, in, in Europe in general. Now, I know that's a big statement and there's a lot of exceptions to that rule. But in, in, in general, I, 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 just, I, I just have the, a strong belief on my, uh, of that being true. And, and that's my life experience. And I'd like to hear your comment on that. Um, okay, yes, uh, I am. Um... Having been to, um, having grown up, having grown up in England, you know, I, I was there for the first thirty years of my life, uh, so I worked in England, and of course, um, England is, is 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 has a even today has a fairly rigid class class system, um, which which does so so one of the main effects is. Uh, alongside the state system of, of education and healthcare and, and housing, you have you have um, the wealthy elite that that have a totally total parallel system. You have private education where they go to Eton, Harrow, and such schools, and such schools were founded four or five hundred years ago, and also they founded the uh, colleges in Oxford and Cambridge. So these people can go to Eton, like Boris Johnson, and go off to uh, Oxford as he did. You know, it's like a you know a nice easy slide, 
And so these people um, enter the, the, uh, the civil service and professions uh, and gain because of you know, the contacts, you know, the, the, the top positions. And they are, they are not the brightest of, of the bunch. As, as I know, because I mean, I, 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 came, I went up through the, the state system. So I met these people in, 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 in college and, and work. And, and, and they're really not the brightest. You know? the, some of the brightest, of course, are thrown up by the working people. And, and you know, as you know, my, my father was, was just an, you know, my, my, my family might be described them as a petit bourgeois. Some of them had businesses as my grandfather did and so on. You know, they, they, they were okay, but they certainly weren't the, the privileged elite by, by far. And certainly after the war, my family, was, you know, my father was, was ill, and so, so we certainly were. So, so as I say, so that's one of the big, big you, have, you have a class structure that causes England to be the way it is. They, they, in fact, this class structure um, has meant that, that they, they, they own and control the big businesses, and so they, they, they delight in selling them off to the highest bidder, which is usually foreign corporations and so on. Because they, you know, then they, you know, they make out like bandits. Now, my wife came from Scandinavia, Finland, and so on, and and, and of course Scandinavia, you know, has a very high standard of living and social care, which which is often derided, you know, by by the Tory Party in England and of course the GOP here, and so um, and countries like Switzerland have a higher standard of, of than America does, and certainly when you go to to places like well Denmark and, and Norway and Sweden and Finland, and you and as I have done, I, mean, I went to Finland in in the mid uh, '60s, and you know, the, so where my relations lived, I mean, they, they had dirt roads. Go there today, and they have like three or four ring roads around Helsinki, and all of them live in nice big houses and, and are taken care of. Thank you, so, Jeff. That's so, so that's respect. an explanation. A quick. I, I would yeah. respectfully suggest that um, millions and millions and millions of people want to come into this country because they they can see that there's a chance uh, to make money and to take care yeah. of their and live okay, live uh, uh, decently. And uh, I don't I don't think there are millions and millions of people. You tell me if I'm wrong, uh, clamoring to get into UK or Germany. Uh, no way. Maybe I'm I wrong. Think they are. Well, well they, they, um, in fact, the, um, the immigrants coming in, you know, after America went to the Middle East and shattered it, actually, you have lots of refugees coming into Europe, okay? And, and mostly they go where the way, to, like Germany is, is a big. Now, they're also trying to die and come across the channel to get into England because, because in their home countries where they earn something like, uh, you know, Forty dollars a week or something, you know, anywhere, you know, in 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 the West is better than where they came from, okay. and and so you know, and so this is why I mean, you take Latin America, which you know, is is a basket case actually. I mean, uh, and and you know, and, and the drug violence and everything else, you know, and, and it, 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 they can't make it, so they're, they're throwing their kids across the border and so on. So. Anywhere that has a higher standard of living is is, is a magnet. And, and so Western Europe, any country is now a magnet. Actually. The higher standard of living is the USA. <laughs> okay. That's okay. not, that, it, it's not the highest actually. It, it's not the highest in the world. You know, uh, places like Liechtenstein and, 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 and um, um, well, I Switzerland. I, have, I, I, I love Switzerland. That's a very rich country. I know that. I've lived there too. So, yeah. and so, so there are countries in Western Europe with, and of course, you know, it, the problem in, in America. I, I talked about the social disconnect. Actually, um, as I say, you, you know, I mean, if, if you come to America and you're educated, you'll do okay, as I do. Um, now, but if if you're uneducated. You'll, you'll come to a low wage job and you'll be at the bottom of the pile and, 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 and you won't do so well. Very good. Thank you, John.
Okay, now, Dan, Dan, Eliana, you got your hand up for the next question. Please go ahead. Or Dan, whoever's there, you guys got your hand up for the next question. So uh, please go ahead, Eliana, if you're there. Hello, uh, yeah, I'm here. All right, Dan, uh, so go ahead. Be nice Lana's to show yourself, here. Dan. Okay, Lana's here, yeah. All right, so something you can do, you can take your money out of Chase Bank and uh, put it into a credit union. That's what you can do. Do you think that's a good way to do it, John? To do something that people can do? Well, I, in point of fact, in point of fact, um, most of my, I, I, uh, I do belong to the to the uh, credit union in Dallas, um, and so that's where uh, my um, my free flowing money is actually in Dallas. Right now, I've I have t tens of thousands of dollars in, in, in the credit union. I mean, I. I, I do believe in, um, in in mutualization, actually, of of, of um, which is which really is, is ownership. So so yes, I, I do believe in credit unions. Good. Okay, uh, Mr. Bob, I know you haven't had a question yet. Do you have anything you'd like to ask uh, our speaker tonight, John Beasley? Um. Yeah, uh, John. Uh, what role do you think uh, the government played, uh, like as far as uh, you know, uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac uh, in uh, making uh, and guaranteeing loans for unqualified home buyers? Uh, what role do you think that played in the 2008 real estate crash? Well, it, 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 I think it played, I wouldn't say a, a key role, but it certainly did, did play a, a role because um, as I say, when the, when the monthly payment outstrips the ability of people to pay, that was, that was the cause of the um, 2009 and eight crash when the, when the whole housing market crashed and that brought down the whole economy. And so, yes, in, um, because you know, Right. Anyone who was breathing actually could could, could get a loan. All, all, all you needed was, was to be. I mean, you you could be sitting in you know in your string vest on, on a on a back porch of a rundown tattered house in in the middle of Mississippi and get a loan. You know, it was you know it was it, it actually got to laughable. And of course, the fact of the matter is. Everybody in, involved in the real estate racket profited. I mean, you know, the, the real estate agents were getting big fees. The uh, the title companies were getting big, big fees. The credit aid agencies were cooking the books. Right, e everything was a triple A rating, which was fraud. So it was a lovely gravy train while it lasted. You know, in all these bubbles, you know. There's there's this book called The Madness of Crowds, okay, you know, and uh, in my book I I talk about George Law actually, who, and anyway, so my book has a lot of features about all of this. I reckon, but anyway, so really it was it was a, another um, demonstration of, of this mania, the, the, like the dot com boom, for example. Where you know, if you had any idea about doing something with software or hardware, there was a huge boom, and of course, it was all based on thin air and, you know, and crashed. And so, you know, these 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 bubbles are are, are, are always recurrent in this crazy R system. You see, so yeah, so that's what happens: in the uncontrolled crazy system. I, no I regulations. Have Sorry. Is that okay, Tim? Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Now, John, go ahead. No, no. Like I yeah. said, everybody had a chance to go first. Go ahead and uh, ask your question, please. Question is, um, uh, you know, one is my concern. I just saw a thing about artificial intelligence, and the um, Kai Fu Lee talks about these superpowers. I mean, I think that's you know the amount of money that goes into war and we've become a surveillance capitalism uh, warring against these 
But even, you know, the smartest guy in this PBS artificial intelligence documentary, which people should see, you know, says he's invested in a lot of surveillance technology and um but he's like it's going you know the chinese are going to win and or the technology is going to win and um that you, he uh and the inequality is going to be just dramatically worse and that you know i guess to me you know you can look at these domestic agendas but i i think we do have to look at the macro and this technology as a technocracy scares me but um but the other little minor comment on your analysis is my understanding is you sound more like Hayek, it was Hayek versus Keynes. My stepfather was an economist and friends of Milton Friedman and Ayn Rand. And, you know, he, it was either you give the money to the corporations or you give it to the people. Keynes said, give it to the people, which I would agree with. I, it, it constantly baffles me that you talk about Helmar Schatt, who, you know, was seemed to be giving it to Hitler and, uh, you know, the Bank of England and the Bank of International Settlements. I mean, they we need to give it directly to the people and not just a little handout. But, you know, it I, I do think Keynes and um, Galbraith and there is a lot that was better before really a fascist. We've got an invisible fascist government um, through the crown and the city of London. And uh, we've got to call it out. And that's maybe that's a conspiracy theory because I think it is a, cons a vast right conspiracy that uh, we're up against. I'd like your comment on that. <laughs> yes. Um, this, well, I, I'll talk about the city of London a bit, actually. Um, okay, this, this book here talks about, title is um, America Confronts the British Superpower 1945 to 57. Um, this, this author is, is very good. Anyway, the, 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 contention, the contention was that by 1957, you know, England was finished. You see. Well, by the end of the 50s, America was running a, a trade deficit. And in, in 60, 61, um, JF, uh, JFK went to Europe to enjoin the Europeans to please prop up the dollar because the dollar was pegged at $35 an ounce. And of course, you could buy dollars at $35 an ounce or gold at $35 an ounce, sell it on the, the London gold market for much higher. Therefore, you know, that put the dollar in jeopardy. And so uh, for a time, the, the Europeans were able to do that. So actually, um, America began to falter actually from, from 1960 onwards. And, and of course, as we've just discussed earlier, was forced off the gold standard in 73. Again, this is all in my book, <laughs> um, which is why it's worth reading actually. Um, so, um, but you see the city of London, you see, which had been in place since um, for 10 centuries, was really not defeated because it immediately um, used other ways of making money. And the first way was to take um, control of, of the Russian money because Amer Russia didn't want to put money in, into American banks, but they did trust the British banks. Now, as time went on, the, the, uh, the rem remnants of the British Empire, like the Cayman Islands, Bermuda, and so on, have become the re repository of the world's financial criminals, tax evasion. And so if you want big money, you go to the city of London these days, and they have uh, a piggy bank in, in this in remnants of the British Empire, of something like 40 to 50 trillion dollars actually. So that's what, so, so the city of London you see has, has, has recovered, you know, its, its role in, in the world of big finance. Now, I'm not condoning it actually. I'm against these criminals as much as anybody else. And they have become, but you see in the financial world, 
is replete with total criminality, actually, and they always get away with it. But it's an odd twist, you see, you know, how, how the city of London, you know, which is the square mile of the financial district, always, re always regains its feet and has done so for, you know, the, the past 10 centuries. It's just very interesting, actually. Um, so, you know, now, uh, so, uh, you know, look, this, this world is full of criminals. They always cheat the little guy. And as, I, as you've heard tonight, I'm in favor of helping the little guy because it's the little guy that actually are the bulwark of a whole economy. If he is doing well, yeah. then the whole economy does well. Social problems disappear, okay? There is no need to have guns to defend yourself against you know, government. If yeah. everybody is doing well, you know, you, you, have, you have such a, uh, an uplift. You know, Jim Peeler, who was second in command in Dallas down here, worked for an employee owned company and he was a fairly right wing guy. But when I would always bring this up, he would say it was wonderful. The motivation was phenomenal of employee owned companies. And so, you know, logically, ideologically, and economically, I'm, and, and politically, I'm, I'm in favor of, of, you know, employee ownership, provided it's set up, not just given shares, because that's, that's not employee ownership. That's like, phony ownership it's when you have real control where when you 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 vote in the board of directors and when the board of directors in turn um appoint the company officers and so on that's true that's true economic democracy next question Jim. I'm asking the question, is there anything good about the United States system? Well, is that a question? Yeah, I'm asking John Beasley if he knows about anything good that's happened in the United States capitalistic system. Okay. Um, well, what I would say it survived it survived, um, it, um, but, um, well, of course, you know, look, the, um, the biggest jump in, in the, okay, all, all, 1929, there was a huge crash, you know, um, and for 10 years, the, cut, the country was on its back, okay. Yeah. Now, the Second World War, with huge fiscal government spending, within, within a year or so, everyone was back to work, okay? Women went back to work. I mean, there was huge technological progress in America. And it was, it was, it was um, so much so, that was basically Kenyans, Kenyan, Kenyans on steroids, actually. Um, and um, by the way, Elmar Schacht called himself you know, the foremost Keynesian actually uh, in the world. So you had a huge dose, dose of Keynesian economics, okay? That got the country you know, energized, got everyone back to work, really built up the country, okay? But, but so yes, um, what you might call um, a dose of, of Huge financial fiscal stimulus were all uh, in in an under uh, utilized economy. will put it back on, on its feet. Okay, so so yes, and uh, of course the fifties were great for most Americans because after the war, you know, they had the GI Bill, so they had you know good op educational opportunities. Uh, Housing was 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 created because they had the space and raw materials and so on. So during that period, it was great. But as I said, starting in the sixties, America began to go off track, and especially starting in the eighties, you know, it really went off track. 
because the neocons reverted back to uh, Adam Smith classical economics, yeah. and and you had boom and bust ever since. And in every and in every cycle, you had you had the um, the industrial base of the country being diminished. Okay, and so and so uh, you know the country sabotaged itself in, in my view, and so yeah. the capitalist system, you know. It has to be has to be controlled, actually. I mean, yeah. And and yeah. so and so you can you can do it under you know un, under a what I would call a, a social um, economic system, actually. But that does in that, that but, but the main point is, if you want a happy, prosperous, going country, you've got to make sure that the poorest. And, and the least able are taken care of. I mean, my I look, look I, as I say, I, I was in charge of 300 people in Xerox. My job was to make sure all of them were as successful as I could make them. And that's what I honestly tried to do. And I retrained some of them. I would send them off to courses, okay, and so on. Because when they were successful, I was successful. I, I couldn't succeed without them. And I made that plain actually to them. And I told them, look, I don't know everything. If you see I'm making a mistake, come up and tell me. You know, I'm not perfect. I don't claim to be perfect. But my job is, is to try and, you know, promote everyone to, to reach their optimum level. And, and we did succeed in that. And the reason I wasn't kicked out of Xerox, actually, because I, I wasn't liked by top management, actually, too, too much, um, because I told them to stay out of my hair in a way. And, 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 but we did deliver. We, we put out some very good products, actually, which I'm proud of. I mean, I put out the first um, computer printer, actually, which printed regular eight and a half by 11 pages and made that thing work. And that was quite a trial and went on to, to other things like wood, the first uh, full page uh, word processor and so on. So, so we did that. And it was great, and, and, and the people I got were, were great. I hired the best, paid them as well as I could. And so, yes, uh, but the problem is the capitalist system has fatal flaws in it. It's, and so, when greed and stupidity take over, you know, this is this. Is, so, America now has every eight year it has a major crash. And when it does. The corporations cut back, fire people, cut back on R and D, and so on. You know, which is fatal. If they, you know, I mean, when there's, you know, Germany. See, I've given talks about what you know, German Germany in in, in a recession actually funds com company to retrain itself. They have this Kurtz Ar Arbeit, for example, which is like which is short working. So so. They, you know, they work with their industry to, to, to retrain workers. I mean, in the coal industry, you know, if all those, I mean, why would you want to work in the coal industry in Mansion State, wonderful Joe Mansion State, and get black lung disease? I mean, you know, if you had a, a program of retraining everybody in West Virginia you, and bring in well-paying jobs, they'd leave it in, you know, they certainly wouldn't vote for idiots like Joe Manchin, who has no clue about how to revive an economy in West Virginia, or from what I can see, or help the ordinary working people. So yes, I mean, look, um, you know, the capitalist system, you know, you, you, must, you must have finance to do things. But when you, when you have a system that's so greedy and stupid, in my judgment, it it, it 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 screws itself, and that, and and that's what's happened. America has sabotaged itself. I mean, I just pinch myself, pinch myself to see America. I mean, did, did make, Charlie, let me one, make one last point. The notion of of these um, often arts graduates in, in in charge of technical businesses going to China. And handing over technology to gain access to the so-called markets, you know, 
is is asinine in, in the extreme. I can't imagine any sane person doing that, but that's what they did. That's what this wonderful capitalist system does and did. And so, you know, I, I you know, I, I pinch myself when it started, you know, in, in, in the eighties. You know, like Walmart was, you know, I had a friend who had a thriving uh, manufacturing business in, in manufacturing clothes. And Walmart came to him and said they wouldn't buy from him unless he switched his production to China. Uh, I mean, Walmart who pays, you know, starvation wages and sabotages the country in the same, in, at the same time, you know? So look, um, no, I, I, uh, I think that, that, you know, look, to, to get going, maybe the capitalist, but I don't think the capitalist system really was, was ever that great, really, but when you look at it in, in the sweep of history. It, 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 you know, um, because, you know, the big thing, the big thing, the big fatal flaw, which I'll talk about, is, is the, these so-called investors are never really investors. They're speculators. So what they always demand is liquidity, which means you almost must have a stock market because they almost must, must get their money out, you see. And so they have no real interest in the business, only the, only the money they can make from it. And, and really, they don't care. They can sell out and move their money out you know, at a moment's notice. They're not really interested in the business per se. They're just interested in, in its money-making capacity. And, uh, you know, you have takeovers you know, by KKK and company that take over a company and bleed it to death. Okay. Now that can, and, you know, and it, you know, a worker-owned company would, 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 would never happen. It couldn't happen. Exporting it all to China could never happen under an, under an employee because employees would never allow that. But it goes on under a capitalist system. So, so I think capitalism is has fatal flaws, and, and, and uh, those of which I've just elucidated. Uh, that it, and um, so, um, yeah, that's that's and you see it. You see this boom, boom and bust cycle. And uh, you see growing uh, social uh, disconnect and mayhem. And our friend there loves more and more guns. Well, under such a situation, more desperate people go to drugs and guns and violence you know, breaks out. It's just wonderful. And somebody the other day was lying in bed with his and got shot through the head. A bullet came from somewhere and killed him. He was lying in bed, minding his business. Well, so you know, basically, you got no faith in the American system, and you think it should be replaced by something else, correct? And, and the same thing I think about England, actually, too. You know, I, I do. I would, I would re, I would replace it with a system that that uh, recognizes the value of the ordinary working person and gives him a say in an economic uh, say in things. Can I ask you because, a I, because yeah, so you know, look, um, you know, but but you asked me, okay, someone said, well, why are people flooding in? Yes, people from poorer backgrounds in 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 countries that are nothing more than you know despotic countries, like most countries in uh, in Latin America. No wonder they want to flee from this violence and drug cartels and so on and so forth and bad economies. Yeah. So, yeah. So I, 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 I've, I've explained what system I'd, I'd, I'd replace it, and, and what controls you need to have. I think I haven't explained, you know, in detail, but um, you know, uh, you've got the general gist of it. I think. <laughs> I'm okay. The, I'm, I'm, okay. Any, any, any other questions? Yeah, I had just one or two. When about you said the tenth um, ten amendments came from England, uh, 
the glorious revolution is where did you get that that's one i've never heard before especially that right. okay <laughs> now what i said was after the glorious revolution they brought in uh, william of orange okay but it it was under the, uh, he had to sign the the bill of rights these these 10 statements of the bill of rights um which meant they, that that and, and it, by the way he he could have his own cabinet ministers the, the king then could have his own cabinet of ministers but each minister was at the approval of parliament so you see the history of england is more and more democracy and less and less so nowadays the king doesn't have a cabinet in fact the cabinet resides in the house of commons and so the prime minister selects his cabinet from elected members of parliament within the house of commons so that's the way it works in england america is now stuck as i said it's stuck as england was you know 200 years ago but but the bill of rights okay you know, the, the first 10 amendments came from the British uh, Bill of Rights. Hmm. Okay. So this and is why really, you know, understanding what happened in England really and handed, handed the culture over to America is worthwhile. You know, this is where mo many of these things came from, the parallels. And having, you know, having gone through British history, um, you know, I, I naturally know them and, and can see and see, you know, every other English speaking people that was a colony now has a, a proper parliamentary system. And it has a, you know, it's inherited the English educational system, which I say if, if they go by the University of London standards, it, it's a pretty decent system. Also, you see judges in, in Tanzania with wigs on. So they inherited the British system of justice, which is, is reasonably fair, I think. Um, right. You see, so America got kicked off with this um, you know, notion of a Supreme Court, which didn't exist in England until Tony Blair introduced one. And the court immediately began to pass laws favoring the rich. I think, you know, what would you, what would you expect? <laughs> but um, so you know, I, I'm not. You know, I'm not one to praise what's gone on in England at all. I mean, I'm, I'm as much against it as anybody else. You know, right. I, you know I, as I say, I think, I think government, government's main job is to make sure, just as I did with my people, is to make sure that every American, you know, has a decent standard of living and fulfills his true potential. And, you know, and, and as, and as, as it, leads a pretty nice life. And, and, and this country could do that, actually. It's wealthy enough to be able to do that. Right. I and agree. one thing, I, the police state is, and this colonialization and unitary executive power, I think we agree that those are the problems, but they're invisible. You know, this invisible surveillance state and the way America and England both went in there and destroyed, you know, the Middle East and, and actually, you know, NATO now seems to be playing games on the border of Russia and along with the banking. And I think we all agree this is what's bad, but it we we're so powerless. Um, you know, and so I, I like you go back in history and study this. And I think that's why y'all call me a conspiracy theorist, because there really is a a vast right wing conspiracy that we have to study history to to understand it. But the crazy thing is we need to I wish there was some international law and a way of defining, you know, this is really what history, this is what what's really going on right now. There's one version of the news where I feel like, boy, BBC's getting their their words are scripted like propaganda and this is this is fascism which is the biggest threat that we and we dare not even it's never mentioned and much less i've watched it it's corporate corporatocracy you know just george orwell 1984 all over again and um but it's so invisible and nobody talks about it except me and you know 
And yeah. the, the other thing is, I mean, the, the vaccine, if in fact it was bad, I mean, why can I not teach, go to school, go to movies, go to restaurant? I mean, it seems like a basic human right that, that they don't have the right at this stage since it's basically the flu. You know, so I don't know if you could comment on any of that. Well, um, <clears throat> you know, um, George Orwell, one of my heroes, I have about four or five heroes that were alive during my lifetime, um, wrote the book called 1984, and he predicted, you know, all this would happen, where basically the, the, you, you have a totalitarian state that controls people's lives and so on and so forth which is why democracy must be defended actually uh, at all costs. Um, you, know, um, you know, during the thirties, you, you had the isms, you had communism on the one hand and fascism on the other hand. And um, many countries today are, are, are purely totalitarian states. And so, uh, you know, if you, if you look at the, uh, what happens in these states, uh, you know, they, they just, uh, you know, rape and pillage the people. Don't you think and, and we're then, a totalitarian state, but we don't know it? You know, we, and we don't teach that we well, have to watch out for it? You know, in the sense, in the sense that the money elite has creamed off most of the um, increase in productivity o over the last, um, 40, 40 plus years, 45 years, ever since 1975. Yes, that that's that's quite true. Because the average worker is, is you know is about the same as he was you know 40 years ago in terms of earning power. Mm. Whereas the uh, the the economy has has increased what sixfold. Anyway, you know. So where's where's the increase gone? Well, it, it's gone it's gone to the mostly into the, you know, the investment banks and um, hedge funds and all the rest of it. And of course their money is, is, is usually in it. The problem is with so much money going to the money elite, it's not being invested, in, it's not invested in productive investments. It's, it's all invested in static, like, like, like property. And so, you know, you know, my house is much more, it's much worse, more, more worth much more than it was 40 odd years ago, but it's still the same house. In fact, it's degraded a bit, but it's worth much, much, much more. And so that's, you know, that's an example really of, of a system that, you know, where the with, where wealthy elite put their money into, into non-productive investments that we need in America. Uh, you know, with the infrastructure. I mean, in many in many senses, like take Texas. I mean, it has a power grid that's that's archaic and fail, failed catastrophically a year ago, and the lights went out because being Texans are so proud, they wouldn't connect to the mm -hmm. national grid. The only city that did, El Paso, in far west Texas, was connected to the the east the western. Uh, line and and so and and the power did not go out so hello yeah so you know when you when you when you re rely upon money seeking corporations to do the right thing for the for the common good you're onto a losing proposition actually you really are onto a losing proposition every time and so you know Hence my talk with the fleecing of America, really. The American public, especially the poorest, have been fleeced. Okay. Well, I think it might be time to get, there was anybody else have one more question or let's go to rebuttals. Yeah, I, I, I have a quick question. Go right ahead, Raj. Uh, John, do average person want to take responsibility for his, his or her own life? And, uh, if they want to, are they capable in this complex society to take responsibility of their own life? Yes. No, look, I, I agree that every person should be responsible for their own life. 
I mean, I would agree. However, circumstances happen where things are out of your control. I mean, you can work for a company for 30 years and have special skills in that company. When it goes broke, you're out the door, goodbye. And in a system that has no proper way of re retraining people, especially when, you know, if you lose your job when you're over 40 or 50, you're done for. Really. Uh -huh. And so, you know, so yes, you are responsible, but, but in, in many circumstances, things happen beyond your control. Uh -huh. I mean, when your job gets shipped to China, what can you do? You know, you're forced to take another job, but a much lower pay normally. That's it. You can't afford, um, when, when the, as it did in 2008 and 9, when, when the real estate market crashes and, and it, in train causes unemployment, you can no longer pay the mortgage on your house. The banks, the banks come and re repossess your house. And that happened in 2008 and 2009. So there are things at the macro level that happen beyond your control. As, however, however careful you are, however you know, well-trained you are, things happen. You know, a family, a, a husband can die, for example. And the wife is left alone, so obviously sometimes with, with many children. And she's up against it, especially if she's been an at-home housewife. The job she's going to go to as an untrained person you know, can't support her. So what I'd say is, yes, yes, everyone is responsible. They should, they should exercise they should eat healthily and so on. But sometimes things happen that are beyond their control. And my take is, because as I said, I do believe in the words that Jesus said, where we, we, we are our brother's keeper in this world. We only live once. We should have kindness, tolerance and compassion. And we should put ourselves in other people's shoes, oftentimes. I have a question. Yeah. Hey, so, yeah, I hope that answers your, your question as well as I can do. So, okay, another question. Can I ask you a question? Hello? Yes. Yes, ask your question. Okay, my question, uh, you know what's going on right now? Uh, with Ukraine and Russia. I hope you know what's going on. So, uh, so uh, speaking about economic future, blah, blah, blah. And I'm not in Russia, of course, and I'm not in Ukraine. So I would like to go visit, uh, back to visit for one week maybe. Anyway, my question to you, what do you think, who provoked really this war? between Russia and Ukraine, because Russian people like here, simple people, they don't want any war. I'm not sure oh. if Putin even won a war. So, so what's going on? Can you tell me, you think it's gonna be war between yeah, Russia and Ukraine and, and right now a couple months or no? What do you think? Absorbing economy? Well, and, 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 okay. well yeah. I certainly hope not. I certainly hope not. I think um, the problem is the problem is that Russia is a totalitarian state. It's not a democracy. Um, Russia, you know, when when the Soviet Union collapsed and uh, all these satellite countries were formed, including mm -hmm. Ukraine, Belarus, and so on, um, that was a great blow to Russian prestige. Which of course, um, you know, people like Putin feel. Also, you know, uh, the what used to be the Soviet bloc, like Poland and so on, Czechoslovakia, Yugoslavia, uh, have now joined the West. They joined basically NATO. 
So yeah, but that, but Russian, Russian that, says that, like even a couple of days ago, they not intended to have war. Who provoke? What do you think? Who provoke Russia pushing Russia to have war with Ukraine? It's ridiculous. Well, what do you think? What's well, your opinion? The um the 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 wielders of power, known as politicians, actually, mm -hmm. um, are driven mostly by their own egos and, 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 and so on, mm -hmm. um, as, as, as Hitler was and, and as the Russians were. I mean, Russia attacked poor little Finland, you know, in 1938, okay? Because they, they, they wanted to protect themselves and so on. And um, poor little Finland kicked their ass for a while, actually. So, um, so Russia... You know, Russia, Russia always, always has this, this um, complex really of, of protecting itself by, by gaining buffer states uh, to uh, so on. So, so that's their inclination. Now, of course, um, now who provoked all of this? Um, you could argue both ways. Number one, the NATO did expand the eastwards, okay? get uh, Poland and so on and so forth. Because it can uh, shake all, all planets, Putin, you know. Putin, First Europe no, Putin, and then you know, countries, they depend. No, okay, let me finish. Right? If, you, if you would let me finish, okay. Putin did, did, did attack uh, Ukraine mm -hmm. by, by taking over the Crimea, which is part of Ukraine. And now he's massing, and also, he also um, had an incursion in, in um, West, uh, Eastern uh, Ukraine, actually, which were heavily populated by, by Russians, actually. And so a, 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 a sort of a war stalemate probably is still going on as far as I know there. And so, uh, you know, now, yeah, it's, it's always a grab for power and a grab for territory. Um, and so, yes, it's it's very concerning actually, because I but um, one would only hope that um, I mean like like Khrushchev you know was 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 gained uh, you know a, a land land um, opportunity in Cuba and the missile crisis and so on, and that was very very concerning. But that was resolved amicably actually. Through sort of a, a, a mutual beating of the powers, and so one can only hope that there's um, a, a meeting of, of much wiser people. And um, because because unlike Hitler, who was bound and determined to get to get land, extra land for Germany, no matter what at what cost, um, I don't believe Putin really wants to get land for the sake of land. But he is concerned about security, and so and he says he wants assur assurances from the West. Okay, well, you know when uh, when Noble Chamberlain went to meet with uh, with Hitler in Munich, he he went and so he wanted assurances from Hitler about non-aggression and no war. And he got hit, hit the signature on such an agreement, but it meant nothing to Hitler. It was just a piece of paper. And so, yes, um, yeah. So all, all I can say is about the whole thing. Um, I have I lived through the whole of the Second World War, um, living in London, of course. You know, got some of the first. So I would hate to see any more of it. Right. It's very scary about... because, you know, you know, you imagine, like, I don't know who do really pushing Russia. We understand that Putin want to back Soviet Union, you know, he would like to back USSR. Okay, he, uh, he uh, attack. Uh, I think he's uh, answered the question. Hold on, hold on. And he have uh, crime, 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 you know, crime, crime right now, crime. So Tim, it's not are you there? Okay. Yes, so, I'm there. It's scary Hello. because yeah, I'm here. Yeah, I'm here, Charlie. Hello. 
No, but Charlie, the one I'm was. here. Are you the one I'm here? Well, I was going to let her finish real quick that. because I think we're all set. Um, Alana, no, did you get not. your question no, answered? No, we're not. Because you know what, it's a very big issue. You know what, you think it's only concerned uh, Russia and Ukraine? No, it, 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 it touch all economic and all Europe first, and then it can, you know, America and Russia can have even worse relationship. And it's not good for people, it's not good for economic. So that's what, what the solution, how, what to do, how, how to not to have war. People right now in age, you know, in Ukraine and Russia, simple people who have family, you know, and, and they scared. So that's what I'm asking you guys opinion, like from here, from this country, Charlie, what do you think? Tim, what do you I think? think Brian, I think, what do you think? Soviet Union, Brian, what do you think? Russia ought to stay out of the neighboring country. Is that very huh? complex? <laughs> you All invade right. another country, then okay. yeah. it's like All they right. said right. in Tibet. They said, do you think this is, okay. Tibet was invaded by okay, China? before we go down And they rabbit. asked the Chi Tibetans, do you think we're part of China? They, and they said, we Brian, what do you before. Okay, before, we go, Brian, we, before we go down this rabbit hole. Brian, what are you talking about? You smart, How's Brian. Stop? What's what this topic? Okay, the thing no, is, the thing is, no, we don't do want to, we want to go now into rebuttals. It's a question and Yeah, Brian, answer. what do you think? I want to know your opinion, Brian. You want to answer to me? I, I think the U.S. Plan? should stay out of Russia's sphere of influence. Like, Is Russia has like, historically, Ukraine, yeah. Belarus, the Baltic states, the U.S. and oh, like, NATO should, should stay out of Lithuania again. Stop Boy, trying to set up military bases in those countries. Yeah, I'll, the I'll, U.S. I'll, need to, needs to mind its business. Right. For right. 50 years, we were a captive nation. And you want that again? Okay, huh. now... Lithuania no, finally got free. Uh, the thing is, guys, I don't want to go down this rabbit hole anymore. I want to go into rebuttals now. Who has rebuttals tonight? Who cares what happens to Lithuania? Right. So what if they get enslaved again? I, I thought you said they were going to be going under that. glorious communism and socialism. It's so much better over there. I, let's just, I'll do uh, a rebuttal. Uh, all right, let's get into rebuttals. We're going to go let... Uh, we're going to do Ellen first, and then Brian, you want to go next? And then uh, Margaret and Frank, I'll let you go next. Um, uh, Margaret, I'll let you go next. Charlie, I know you got something. I think uh, Bob, uh, Bob, you got anything you want to add to it? I'm sure you do. Um, and then... Uh, I'll do Charlie. So I'm not going to do a rebuttal tonight because I've, mm -hmm. I, I, I don't want to be uh, arguing with our speaker and opening up another rabbit holes tonight. But uh, John, <laughs> John, you know, the thing is, I, 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 I can see where you're coming from with your presentation. All right. Uh, what do you guys think? If you're willing to stay a little longer, I'll do. You want to go to Alana? No, I'll try to see how Margaret is doing. <laughs> was curious. No, no, no. We're, 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 we'll find out. Let's just go. It's okay. All right. I just, I just Here's what I have. I have Ellen, Hi. Brian, Margaret, uh, and then uh, if if uh, if Bob Matter wants to go, I will let him go after Margaret. Because if not, Bob, you have a rebuttal or not? Well. Okay. Oh. All right. Yeah, I'm, I'm a little tired tonight. Okay. All right. Then I'll go Ellen, Brian, Margaret, and Charlie. Give you each five minutes. <laughs> then we'll let uh, John Beasley close up with his final remarks. And uh, then we'll go off to the other thing. So, uh, Ellen, you got five minutes okay. on the clock. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. Thanks, John. Uh, Luke and I were saying you're a gentleman, which is nice i wish there's more people like you and um i do wish america's political system or just if we were in a classroom and this if this was the uh government of the united states like jamestown you know we need um judicious thoughtful people like you um and me <laughs> and all of us we need to figure out how to how to have a group conscience right how to like aa you know, AA derived 
as a group conscience as opposed to fascism, which they split off, you know, by not having a uh, sect denomination and all organization and public relations. I think the thing is we're subjective. We've got to be subjective and objective, like a healthy functional family. Uh, Ayn Rand was objectivist. And I think that's this invisible totalitarian confusion going on right now that we're kind of like cockroaches in a jar. Um, as uh, my friend Mark Clements was wrongfully convicted for 30 years, as a lot of these 130 people I know by John Burge, many of them are still in prison. The ones that have gotten out haven't gotten anything. And you know, John Burge is just one of many uh, uh, heads of, you know, commanders of the police force that we had here running things like they did in Vietnam and the Phoenix program. And, uh, you know, th this is why I agree with Brian. We've become a, I was a libertarian and I'm becoming one again because really we just have to get out of this secret police take over. We, there really has been a coup d'etat and we just don't see it. This is, um, you know, I, Margaret's questions my authorities on these, uh, on the virus and the vaccines, but it, it's all basically, these are COVID operations. This is the fourth right. This is, you know, in the shadows of a century. I mean, this is plague and, and you know, a national security complex and I mean, it's like we know if you look at history, this is the deep state, the invisible state is there's all of these best books I spent last night reading Crossing the Rubicon with Michael Rupert. And, you know, it's talking about they're planning a bio warfare with a respiratory virus of a flu virus targeting with genetic codes that will target the black people and the brown people so they can reduce the population by 4 billion. And I'm, I, I've been studying this for 10 years and I, you just keep thinking this can't be you know, real, right? I mean, th this is some conspiracy theory that I can't back this up. But what I've done is gone and found all the sources, you know, that where this was said, this is, they're FOIA'd and, you know, um, and the, really the, I'm like, how can I prove this? How can I show what's going on here? And um, the thing is, it's a murder case. The people who said it best, like Michael Ruppert or Sherman Skolnick used to come to the, the College of Complexes, or they, they were murdered, you know? I mean, he's, he makes such a brilliant case. This is, you know, about bio warfare. They're doing it now. They're using the flu virus and they've killed off like 20 microbiologists all around the same time that Bolton in 2006, um, canceled the biological weapons treaty and, and then started giving billions of our money. It's right there to biological weapons development. You know, this same thing, Fauci was speaking for it, the Republicans, this, there's a biological war, they're gonna kill off everybody. It, and it's done actually through chemtrails as Ted, um, you know, from the college would talk about. I didn't really know what was going on then, but it's, they're poisoning us with, uh, you know, they were looking for these biological way to make the, the coronavirus, the AIDS virus, the genetically modified nanobots kill us off. And um, I mean, and the crazy thing is, can you stop, you know, nobody will believe you, you know, because they control the media and just censor, I mean, you know, Naomi Wolf, the smartest libertarian woman there is are, you know, I, I used to think they're censoring me. I'm not right wing, but they're, they're censoring anybody who blows a whistle. Either they kill them, I guess it's better than getting killed. But um, actually I've recently read, you know, I mean, this is what I investigate, conspiracy theory. We have to be willing to have a, a congressional hearing on these conspiracy theories that this is basically investigative journalism it has to start with hypothesis has to start with an investigation and if you you know I, I, one of the killers i was thinking about when the kavanaugh hearing 
And they were like, well, look into it. Did he rape the girl? And they go, you know, the FBI doesn't really investigate. We're, we're, our job is to control you and to, and to propagandize okay, and, wrap it up. and cover up the fact that we're killing off anybody who tells the truth so we can get away with this fact. <laughs> okay, we'll be all. And I'd love to hear Charlie comment on that one. And that's exactly what they're doing okay. in Russia, too. We're trying to take over the world. All right. Ellen, that's good. All right, next. Now, uh, Brian, you got your five minutes next. Uh, go ahead, Margaret, if you want to go. Margaret, you want to go next? Go ahead. Okay. Unmute, please. All right. So, you know, America's built on this idea, right? This enlightenment idea, <clears throat> enlightenment age, that individuals have natural rights. They come from our creators or our creator, and <clears throat> they are unalienable. And by unalienable, they mean that the rights aren't given, they can't be taken away. And these rights include life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. These are individual rights. The further we have gotten away from that idea where we're in some way, you know, the, the common good, that the government has an interest in our lives, the government has an interest in protecting us, the government has an interest in serving us, we have an obligation to the rest of society, we, as we start to, you know, incorporate these ideas and these principles into American ideology, there, there's a clash, right? Because, you know, sometimes the common good may conflict with uh, an individual's natural rights or, or an individual's free exercise of his natural rights. So the... So I just want to start with that as a premise. And, you know, it is government's ability to discriminate among people that has been the cause of a lot of America's problems, you know, from the creation of the Constitution, where they incorporated the three fifths compromise that it, politicians reserved to themselves the right to determine who was a man and who was entitled to unalienable rights and who wasn't. It was like a workaround to an individual, to a person having unalienable rights. So the constitution itself was, was premised on, on basically a fraud that politicians had the right to decide who was a, was a person. Where did they get that? Where did they get that authority from? I didn't give it to them. And so, you know, when we talk about the evils of the capitalist system, we're talking about where, at least as far as I can see, is government involvement. It's government involvement in the capitalist system because it was government that allowed for people to be legally treated as property. That was government. That wasn't corporations. That was government. And had government not done that, then the individuals who were subjected to the institution of slavery, they would have had, they, they couldn't have been because they would have had unalienable rights, but politicians reserved to themselves the right to determine who was a person and therefore they were allowed to institute this um, a brutal inhumane system. So, and that legacy has lived with us until today. And it was government that caused that. It was government that created the financial uh, crash of 2008, they allowed for the system that created that bubble. The government allowed for it by granting to banks the authority to issue the currency. And they can issue as much as they want, inflate housing prices as much as they want. And then when it came time for the crash, because they loaned money to people that couldn't pay them, the government stepped in and bailed them out. Again, it was government that created this problem and then empowered the banks by bailing them out, gave them the cash and liquidity they needed to go and foreclose on people's property. Right. So you're blaming capitalism when the culprit is government and, and the idea that somehow you're going to create this political party that's going to go in and represent the working man. No, they're not, because they'll be corrupted just the same as everybody else that gets into politics. There's too much money, too much power, too much influence for people. People are, you know, especially people who go into politics. They're ambitious. They're clever. They're, they're charismatic, 
right? So these are the people that you are entrusting with all this power when everything in human nature should tell you don't trust that person. Don't ever trust a politician. They're lying. They're stealing. Everything they have is is, is acquired through force and, and treat them as such. Not as somehow they represent you, they, they, you should trust them, you absolutely should not trust them. Okay, uh, Brian, we should gotta get to wrap it up here pretty quick, okay? Um, Margaret, are you next? You got five minutes, I'll restart the clock when you're ready, okay? Thank Over you. Don't um, I don't have too much to say except thank you, John, for another very, um, it, it, uh, another very insightful presentation and another presentation of British history, which uh, we really don't study in our schools at all. And since it's the basis, English common law is the basis of our law and English history is the basis of a lot of things that happened here. It's important to understand those things. I would like to tell um, Ellen is that the thing, the things that happen that she says, it goes totally against um, all of the education and all of the practice that I've had. I was trained in science, um, and um, I have a bachelor's in science. I have a master's in science, and I was trained to look at things scientifically and. You know, I go back and research some of the some of your resources, and um, they've been discredited. They've been debunked. They've been people. The the majority of people who are recognized as scientific experts in various fields have said, "No, that's wrong, and that's wrong, and that's wrong," and you know. So you say something, and I'm like. Where did that come from? So anyway, that's um, that's why I, I respond. So I mean, plus I am getting old, and and all my uh, social inhibitions are peeling away because I just don't have the energy to maintain them anymore. So I get crazy, which I apologize for because sometimes it's not it's obviously not very constructive. But the things you say. The, many of the authorities that you cite are, have been debunked, have been disproved, have been, you know, just uh, totally rebuked by what I consider and what most people consider as scientific authority. So you can go everything from the Invermectin and the, and the whatever. You know, I looked up some of the stuff that, um, who's the, the woman who, um, Cor anyway, she cited a study and I looked up the study and it said, you know, we can't use this study to demonstrate anything because it was based on meta-analysis and there's too mu much difference between the groups that we study to come to any kind of conclusions at all about this. So she cited that study as oh, support of Ivermectin. Anyway, so that's the, that's what I, I'm saying is that when you come out with stuff and, and the, the, the vaccines damage us, that's absolutely not what I'm seeing in my nursing literature, in the, medical, so in, in the medical literature, in the scientific <laughs> literature. It is absolutely Ellen, not. Ellen, Margaret has the floor. Margaret, uh, Ellen. You know, you can, I have, this is an uninterrupted time, dear. Okay. So, okay. you know, it's absolutely, you know, it's just against what I understand about things. And I've seen the data and I've seen, and I've looked at the data from the CDC and all that. And you want to debunk the CBC, it's science. all scientifically based. He's and the majority not. of recognized oh, scientific goodness. experts it are saying bullshit. that what you are saying is bullshit. Okay. Is you don't okay. understand statistics. Ellen, put it in the chat. Be quiet. Ellen will give you a chance to rebut after Charlie. I don't have a chance to rebut that, but it's statistics. One person got 
vaccine, two didn't. That means the vaccine's 100% effective. It's statistically bizarre and ridiculous. Anybody who knows statistics, I have a master's in statistics. It's crazy what they're pulling on us because you don't have a master's in statistics. You don't understand that drug companies have captured the CDC and the FBI, all of them. They've been captured just like a fascist government can get away with saying whatever they want. They're lying to you. Okay, okay, okay. You Ellen, you've made your point. Let's uh, let's go back on. Charlie, you're next up for the rebuttals. Five minutes. All right, let's thank our speaker, John. Beasley, Dr. John Beasley, for a nice synopsis, uh, an overview of uh, history and uh, bringing us up to date on the exploitation of the capitalist system in the United States. Thank you, John. Okay, I've got five points. I'll give you about a minute each. Uh, I heard my earlier in the evening something about, oh, we should decentralize. Uh, I'm a national representative in organized labor. During the week, I read cases from, from individual workplaces around the country and comment on and advise uh, what action should be taken to say that, look, look we're, at, we're at a meeting here uh, with people from all disparate locations and the technology is so beyond, you, you want us to return to the village well, that's not going to happen, my friend. There's after, as a matter of fact, there's no need for this local administration anymore. And there hasn't been for a long time. And this very day, I communicated with people from around the, around the country. And to say, well, I don't have to go there. It doesn't matter where I'm at. No, technology has enabled us has brought us better, as a matter of fact, diminish the need for surface transportation. The next thing is, now you mentioned the quality of products coming from Asia. Now during the week I bought a microwave oven, mainly because the one I had only lasted about a year. And there's a top line ovens. Those are not cheap stuff that I was getting. These are good ones, man. Um, amazingly enough, I was advised by my sister, number one, to keep the box that it came in in order to return it. Because it's not like it's it it very long. She also gave me the paperwork, too. She also gave me the paperwork on the purchase so that I could establish the return policy. And three, she advised me to take out the manual and thoroughly test the device. Also, she helped me out, return my coffee pot, <laughs> which had lasted about, I think it was eight days that I had to return <laughs> because it malfunctioned. Uh, I'm not certain about it. Now, I can understand this. These are products made by children, so they may not be that well done, but that's to be understood. The next thing is um, the, uh, I'm a rail historian, and I want to ask John about British rails, but I'll tell you what happened. British rails were the, 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 the standard railroad of the world incredible infrastructure put in by the navvies. British locomotives were exported around the world and in numerous countries of the Commonwealth, as well as in other countries such as in China. You found locomotives of the finest quality and the highest speeds achievable. Things like the Flying Scotsman and so forth. Along come British Rail and then they came along <laughs> And they broke them up into 13 railroads. And it turned out to be an absolute and total disaster. Oh, let's let's have the free market come in, get rid of this government operated rail network. It went to every village in town that I can I can, from my understanding, everywhere they went, they had passenger service and so forth. And suddenly it became 
I'm serious, it became the laughing stock of the railroad community. I was at conferences and they said, they thought they would never be able to, to bring it back into operation. There were people that said, this is gone. It's never coming back, so forget about it. So also they, the private partnership they tried with the London subway and that was another disaster. There's millions of articles, all kinds of articles about the private sector come in and they destroy the public transit with mm -hmm. a major city like that. Uh, it took years to recover. Now regarding Russia invading another country. Well, hey, guess what? And a few years ago, Russia invaded all kinds of countries like Lithuania and they do it all the time. Now, amazingly enough, you can't understand this. And I still like the story. There was a monk who was in a prison in Tibet because he didn't like the Chinese and he spoke out against them. So once a month, they bring the monk in and they say, do you think the Chinese should be in Tibet? And his own answer was the same. This went on for 10 years. I met the guy. He told them every, every time, once a month, he would say, you weren't here before. I don't think you should be here now. Very simply, that was the extent of his knowledge and understanding of politics. Um, let's see what else. Uh, oh, Matt Trivin, come on, I've done my life studying philosophy. And that your, your, your time's about natural up, law is there's no natural law, is just basic general concepts of philosophy. Okay. Uh, they don't exist unless they're codified into law. Okay, Charlie. You have to have like, hey, hey, come on now. You've been about eight minutes. No, I'm, no, I'm going to finish up here, man. I've been waiting quietly. I never got my last question, Mr. Chair. Uh, I, Talk about uh, violating the rules, huh, Charlie? Yeah, you're darn right. Uh, there's natural law, our only guiding principle. So you need something like a civil rights act. They're typical to, entrepreneur. To does, they don't exist. And uh, also, uh, the government is not violent. That's that's proud boy talk. And to say that the doctors of the world who may be out to make a few bucks are out to harm people is a discredit to the people in that profession. Okay. I've decided to do a quick three minute rebuttal myself. And that is my assertion is that I think John Beasley's premise and most of you guys that think that capitalism are crazy and that it hasn't produced any benefits for the working man and quite a bit of other stuff. Um, I'm gonna bring in a quick one minute, 18 second video with John no Johan Norberg. That's gonna be expressing my opinion quite well and I'll comment on it very quickly afterwards. It's only one minute, 18 seconds, but I think it's going to be exactly the type of things that I would have loved to have said in a rebuttal myself. Writer Naomi Klein puts it, global capitalism lapsed into its most savage form after 1990. All hope for progress and development was lost. The rich got richer, but the poor got poorer. But Klein is dead wrong. As a prolific writer puts it in a new book, Never before in mankind's history have we seen anything like the social and economic progress that we've seen since 1990. Global GDP per capita has increased by almost as much during those 25 years as it did in the previous 25,000 years. Extreme poverty was reduced from 37% of the world population to less than 10%. Every minute that you listen to me, another 100 people rise out of poverty. The proportion of people who go hungry has been halved. Illiteracy has been more than halved, and so has child mortality. The proportion of countries that are democracies increased from 46 to 64%. If this is savage capitalism, then what the world needs right now is a double with fries, please. Yeah, a double with fries. I think what we need is a lot more capitalism. I think what we need is we don't have the economy capitalized enough. And the thing is, for the poor to really prosper, from for the poor to prosper, I think we're going to need a lot more capitalism. Globalization has meant more jobs, more growth, 
more, even more of the, of the world glowing up. Now, the thing is, I do know there's such thing as antitrust laws and a little bit too much power in the top of the hands, but we were able to deal with this through the, uh, you know, Teddy Roosevelt and some of the antitrust suits he had pulled in. We are not making use of it. And yes, I do agree that sometimes capitalism has to be regulated, but generally it has been producing more jobs, more growth, more poverty reduction. And that's and more sweatshops. Well, Charlie, you know, the thing is, is that uh, most people would rather work in those sweatshops and be on the field as peasant farmers, oh. you know, but anyway, enough said Can you about ask that. one? See, you ask one? Uh, Charlie, hey, why don't you come next week and talk to the farm workers? That's some Charlie, about capitalism. Charlie, you know, the thing is, I believe that it's going to be uh, one of the best things that's happened around the world because sweatshops ultimately leads to more development, more corporations, and... Uh, Generally, the world's a lot better off than even when it was. Tim, you work your whole We've life. Had, we Char you Charlie, get out of it. Charlie, you're, you're dead wrong. What do you think somebody comes along and says you're no You're dead wrong, social? Charlie. I agree with him. That's why. That's why I put it up for one minute, 17 seconds, because there's no way I could have gone through that really fast. Somebody anyway. comes along and says the switch up is now closed. Well, Charlie, I've been studying. I've been studying Robert Norbert. Robert Norberg for years. Anyway, I just know that your philosophy of socialism will enslave people. Capitalism will produce freedom and then with along with other requisite benefits. Anyway, enough. I've said my soapbox. I'm done. So, uh, John, you have it there. My rebuttal. You get the last word. Okay. All right. Well, um, I, I would like to thank, uh, you know, the Chicago group for inviting me. It's always, as my wife said, uh, when she <laughs> sent me to the Dallas College Complex, was, you can go and bore them, you see, rather than staying at home. So, me. so I had my chance to bore you tonight, which, uh, which um, you know, you were not I, I like boring people. But anyway, um, <laughs> you were anyway, not boring. Um, what, okay, well. Uh, I would tend to agree, but my wife would. You know. Anyway, um, what, what, what I would say. Your wife's dead that, wrong. Okay, right. Well, she's, she's actually dead. Actually, but, uh, um, so, what, what I would say is that um, th there are many ways of, um, of economic uh, operation. I would, I would uh, posit that it's only when you've ensured that all, all the people are able to participate fully in it, okay? Both, both actively, economically, and politically, and so on, that, that you get the best out of a country. Now, what, what has happened in America is you have an in, in increasingly um, diminished uh, democracy, Okay, where, where more and more people feel that it really doesn't matter who I vote for because you know my vote doesn't count. Because I think they're aware that um, it's the power of big money that goes to both parties that that controls things, and so and so you 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 know they know that there's an army of lobbyists in Washington that basically write the laws, and of course. It's 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 and, and so therefore they uh, it's it's the lobby it's the people who fund the lobby that get the laws they want, which is in favor of them making more money, and and higher profits, and so so the capitalist system that demands higher and higher profits, um, usually comes out of the backs of uh, of the sweat of the of the working people actually. That's where, it, that's where it comes from. And so up until, the fact of the matter is, up in, from 1945 to 1975, the median wage kept track with the growth in productivity. That's, that was, that's a true statistic. After, 19, after 1975, even though the productivity increased about at the same slope, <clears throat> the median wage diverged from it negatively. And that meant that the working people, uh, at the, especially at the bottom, got an increasingly smaller share of the pie. And the people at the top got, uh, got 
an increasingly larger share. Now I've pointed out that when these people at the top get a larger share, then you have a distortion of, of money. You know, you, you, you have a failure to apportion money productively in the economy. And, and that is what's happened, okay. So, and so you've also not taken care of the basic needs of, of people. You don't have a, prop, a proper functioning healthcare system. You really don't have a proper functioning uh, financial system. One that crashes, you know, abjectly every eight years is not properly functioning, okay? You, you don't, and, and so, and I think, and you don't have a, a proper functioning educational system because many people at the bottom really can't afford it, actually. And they, you know, to face, to face a, a debt of what, $100,000, $150,000 is, is just daunting, especially if you're publicly minded and you, you want to go into public service like teachers who are underpaid and so on. And so, you know, Yes, I mean, I don't think really that the, what I'm basically saying is, look, this country is not operating as efficiently as it could. Because when you when you underpay people, they don't perform well. And I think most people at the bottom are truly underpaid. I mean, these these minimum wage, which a lot of people are, are derisively actually, and, and, and also Faintly ridiculous. I mean, two dollars and thirteen cents the person working in a restaurant is is, is on the face of it is, is ludicrous, you know, and and you know it, it's it's indefensible really, I, I think, and and it's a you know, I and I said as I said before, I mean, I read the Bible, I, I do agree with Christian principle, and I think that helping everybody, you know, which 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 means actually not destroying some of the profit margins of, of companies, you know, is, is the right thing, is the moral thing to do, actually. And, and the problem really is the capitalist system as it operates with profit maximization has no morals associated with it. And it, you know, and, and it, it, um, it, it does, it does destroy motivation. Okay. When, you, when you're not in charge of your own be economic behavior, where you where you where your weight doesn't carry, either in the political level or the economic level in, in a company, um, you know you say, well, well, bugger it, I'll just you know look after myself and uh, damn every, damn everything else. Okay, it's it, it's it's a it's a de demoralizing, dispiriting situation. Uh, and, and you know, having worked in you know America now for what 50, fifty plus years, I you know I, I see this actually, you know, um, you know, and, and in England, which still carries on, you know, basically the, the workers hate the management, and the management hate the workers. <laughs> that's a system of, of, of a class conscious country, actually. So I'm not, I'm not, as I said, I'm not defending Great Britain at all in this at all. But I'm not picking on America. I'm just observing the fact that this system could be so much better, really. and these people running it aren't aren't of highest moral character or highest intellectual character either. And so, a, a country run by people with with uh, what I call no no super you know what I call intellectual values or moral values really I think is you know, it is a very sad place to be. And certainly if uh, if, Clinton, if uh, Trump is reelected, I'm certainly going back to Europe. I just, you know, the Texas is bad enough as it is, you know, <laughs> governed by these people. You know, and, and in terms of government, you can't blame government. You, 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 you must blame the people that control and pay the government. You know, you can't say, well, the government's failed. The government hasn't failed. It's 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 because the government has been bought off by by the people. You know, they, it's the you know 
It's the piper. He who pays you know, the piper called the tune. That that's exactly what's happened to the detriment of the average American. And so, yes, we do, as Charlie says, we do have inferior goods. They are suspect. You know? So, you know, so America is being policed, you know, in, in every way possible, actually, morally, you know, financially, and so on. And, and I'm sad to see it because I, I want to live amongst people who are happy, don't go around killing people with, you know, with this gun madness. I, I, want, I want to live amongst people who are happy and prosperous and, and can bring up their families and so on in, in, in a proper, you know, proper functioning manner. I have, I have no wish to, to see uh, mayhem in the streets and, and people going without. Well, I certainly don't want to see any more wars. I having lived through one, you know, Second World War, and the and the, the, the depravity that can happen to a country, so a so-called advanced country that Germany was, you know. So when 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 these maniacs take control, terrible things can happen, and and we I lived through it and saw it, and it was you know felt it, and so you know. I think we, we'd be much better off with, you know, as I say, if we had a, you know, a decent government that was not controlled by big money and we had true democracy, actually. And that, that goes for industry as well. So anyway, so that's, that's, that's my final word. It was, it was nice to see all, all of you again and, and sort of pontificate as I do. <laughs> um, so, um, so, you know, but, but I, I do enjoy the College of Complexes. I, I think it's a very good forum. Uh, I also enjoy the fact that, um, you know, you have uh, all, you know, all, I mean, hopefully all, all kinds of views from the left wing to the right wing. And so everyone, everyone gets a chance to be heard and so on, because I think, you know, that, that is what, you know, a, a proper functioning society needs because it is just these hopefully hopefully we can then come to a consensus that sort of maybe somewhere in the middle will no. make sure that everybody is um, you know ends up better off in a situation where you don't have one faction that you know, you know controlling you know, the lives of, of so many people to, to their detriment anyway thank you very much um, I, I wish you the you know a nice weekend uh, I should be golfing tomorrow in Dallas, so uh, it'll be 60 something degrees, which is nice. And so, uh, you know, I'll be enjoying myself and, and I hope you, uh, you enjoy yourselves too. And, and you know, have a, have a prosperous another week. And I'll probably see many of you again, you know, over, yeah, over the sure. Zoom. Okay. And, 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 and so the Zoom has, has been technology and, and unlike Ellen says is, is 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 a benefit actually because I'm a yeah. technologist myself. Okay. And uh, you know I uh, I, okay. I think we can all benefit from improving. All right. At this point we're gonna hey, thank you everybody. Okay at this point we're gonna <laughs> stop the recording of the college. I'll keep the Zoom call open <laughs> afterwards.